Thanks to coming to this afternoon session, uh, which is going to be on neuromonitoring. We have a really great lineup um, of what's that, eight speakers or eight talks. Uh, we're going to first introduce our first uh, speaker up, who uh, probably needs no introduction, but Professor Giuseppe Citerio from Monza, Italy. And he's going to start us off with automated pupillometry. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. I think we, we are more than in time for this, this moment, so we have uh, one minute in advance. So I will discuss about automatic pupillometry today. These are my conflict of interest. I got a grant by one of the companies producing pupillometry and I'm, the, and the advisory board. I am in the advisory board of this company. So this is the agenda of my talk. I would like to discuss with you why we need to talk about the pupillary light reflex today and how automatic pupillometry could help in uh, better understanding the evolution of the pupils over time and we will review together the evidence available on pupillometry and we we'll try to find some practical conclusion. Thinking about the pupillary light reflex, when we were students we started to, to, to test it, our nurses test it every day and what we are looking for, we are looking about uh, looking for the understanding the relationship between uh, uh, some structure, some uh, cranial nerves, the optic cranial nerves, the third cranial nerve, and some uh, structure of the brainstem and uh, its functionality, functionality. And looking at this slide, there are three different uh, intensity of uh, green. As you can see, there are some elements that could influence the response of the pupils. Uh, for example, the IICP could compress the brainstem, opioids uh, could uh, uh, work uh, on, or uh, opioids could uh, uh, give uh, the pupil a smaller size and pain on the other side could produce a larger pupil and so these are potential indication of the use of the pupillary reflex so we are looking for the functionality of the brainstem and the cranial nerves plus we need to take in account uh, the confounders and if we think about the response that the uh, nurses at the bedside could give us are very simple. Pupillary reactive is okay and the pupils have a normal size or due to drugs or pain we can have a dilated a sluggish pupil. Sorry, it went away. And uh, the, the last point was in red, I cannot return back here but it uh, doesn't matter, is a dilated pupil that is a sign of compression of the brainstem. When we look at the precision of the exam and uh, we see a different size of pupil between below two or higher than two, you can see that generally speaking, one time every five, we made an error in the evaluation of the size and the activity of the pupils. And this error is higher when the pupil is very small. Let's see if this works. And the other problem is that we want to have a warning sign like the compression of the third cranial nerve. We are searching for understanding if the patient is anisocoric or not. And looking at this graph, the red dots are the points in which the nurse give information to the dot of the anisocoria was there, but the white area measured by the, the, by the pupillometry says that there is no difference in pupils. So in, with small pupils, we have a possibility to do some errors. And uh, thinking about the possibility to make a VIX exam uh, automated, the pupillometry start to come to the market at two devices. Uh, we are using in our unit the uh, right side device, uh, the, the pupillometry from, from Neuroptics, and both of them are doing the same are giving a, an important light uh, uh, flash to the pupil and we can calculate something that uh, the device could calculate something that we are not able to calculate looking at the pupil. So the time of reaction, the speed of constriction, the maximum constriction velocity, the amplitude of the reflex. So we can have some element we can measure. And if you think of what you, are you doing in your unit every time when you are thinking about arterial pressure or other parameter, measuring is something we are doing continuously. So we like to have numbers to be trended, numbers to give us an alarm. 
And so the, the device gives us some information, size of the pupil, latency of the reflex, constriction velocity, dilatation velocity, and percentage of changes for both eyes. So we have a lot of information every time the nurse goes to the patient and take a pupillometry evaluation. But uh, on the other hand, uh, having these confounders, mainly sedation, pain, and so on, we can have uh, small pupils, we can have uh, a difficult to understand the reactivity of the pupils. And so the company developed uh, a proprietary algorithm called MPI that, uh, generally speaking, take in account all the elements I described and give you an idea how far is your patient compared to the uh, normal population. And the range here goes from zero, no reactivity, to five is the normal patient. And so we can have also a number summarizing the exam and the pupillary evaluation. Why this is important? Because having a device, we can define trends. And for example, I present you three small trends here. We have a trend with a patient with a pupil that became unreactive, a patient with a normal situation and the patient improving. So we can depict trajectory at the best side more precisely compared to the description of the nurses because we say that there is an error inside. 20% of the time it could be an error in evaluation of the size and there is an error also in evaluation of the activity. So having this device uh, in the market since years, uh, we discuss about uh, what we know about the evidence available on the use of pupillometry. If you think about the possibility to be anticipate uh, a situation in which one pupil is larger than the others, you can see that this reflex could be also influenced a little bit earlier. And so pupillometry could uh, depict, understand but something is going on, for example, for one parameter, speed of constriction, for example, and uh, give you an information that you cannot obtain in other ways looking at the patient. For selected patients, this is a series coming from Lausanne, Maurodo is in the first row. For selected patients, in some situation in, in which ICP with mass lesion inside the CT scan went up, the pupillometry, in this case, the MPI went down. So you can see for small number of patients in this case, there was a relationship between the increase of ICP and the decrease of MPI. And the other way around is when the manitol has been infused, the therapy has been done, to, given to the patient, you can see the reversal of the situation. And then looking at the, at the recent scoping review that has been published on neurocritical care a couple of weeks ago, putting together a study on the relationship between ICP and MPI and, and pupillometry, you can see that there is uh, some information that uh, the device uh, show, the pupillary reactivity show an inverse relationship with trends, and also MPI seems to be a promising tool in this setting. If we go ahead from the traumatic brain injury field and we go to cardiac arrest, this study ran mainly in Europe on 400 patients uh, led by Mauro Oddo, uh, tested the possibility to evaluate the pupillary right reflex early on after the cardiac arrest for understanding if uh, the MPI was able to predict the outcome of the patient and the positive predictive value and the fast positive uh, rate were very good in the first days and uh, was tested uh, compared to the normal examination of a pupil was much better and uh, the information we were able to get uh, from this study is that uh, poten evoked potential give the same amount of information compared to the pupillometry. They're testing the brainstem both. And if you look at this uh, cartoon from the uh, cardiac arrest guidelines, you can see that uh, the clinical examination inserted pupils before now we have also inserted, they also inserted pupillometry inside these guidelines. In editorial, Claudio Sandroni said, but we probably need prospective clinical trial to demonstrate the utility, the benefit of having this tool at the best side. And uh, we started this study that is called the Orange Study that has been published on the Lancet Neurology uh, last autumn. And is a prospective observational multicenter study that uh, had the aim to find if there is any association with a pathological MPI and long-term outcome, six-month outcome. Uh, in three different pathologies, TBI, SIH, intracerebral hemorrhage. And the other secondary aim is to understand if we, are, we were able 
with granular data because the data has been collected every four hours for the first week to understand is where we are able to define a relationship between ICP and MPI. So we enroll a patient with a three pathology I described to you till now, requiring ventilation, intubation and ventilation for neurological reason and admission to the intensive care unit, age 18 years and older. And having pupillometry in the center where we enroll patients as a standard of care. We collect information every four hours, and as you can imagine, this information was used for treating the patient because the doctor having information that the MPI was going down, the doctor was thinking about uh, do a therapy, so we were not in an interventional study, but we were observing what was going on, and uh, we were uh, blinded when we assessed the outcome of the patient. And uh, we didn't define any specific therapy protocol for treating ICP in this setting. We screened one, almost 2,000 patients and 514 has been enrolled, many in Europe, but also in the USA. And this is the general characteristic of a patient. 200 of patients over 500, 514 were trauma. Then we have splitted aneurysma, supranoid hemorrhage, and intracerebral hemorrhage. As you can see at the beginning, 80% of the pupils were normal at the entry of the unit. We didn't have any criteria on the pupil at the entry, and most of the patients have a pathological CT scan for the three different pathologies defined. So the mean value at the beginning was four, and we were surprised at the beginning looking at this uh, distribution of MPI. We are talking about 20,000 MPI for each eye, so we are talking about 40,000 MPI in this setting. And as you can see, I say five is normal, zero is highly pathological, three is the cutoff we are thinking. The MPI algorithm was able to discriminate two populations, a population in the normal range and a population in a pathological range. And so we, we didn't see so much numbers between three and zero. And uh, the other point is that during the week, a quarter of patient had an MPI at least of zero, so a very pathological number. So we say that this is an alarm, but half of the population had at least one MPI going below three. So is the threshold for treatment or for attention. So it's a huge amount of information because pathological pupils were present in the, this population very frequently. We also started to define trajectories of this patient because we have uh, quite granular data. You can see there are patients in normal range, patient with an eye with a problem, patient with problem that has been solved. And we started with Marod and uh, his group of artificial intelligence to explore this trajectory. And, uh, and uh, we will think about uh, in the future how to use this information. But globally speaking, and looking at the primary outcome, looking at the outcome at six months, good patient have a patient with a good uh, Glasgow outcome scale, so I give them four, have a good, uh, have a almost normal MPI, but as you can see, there is a small amount also here of green, so we will discuss later on the trajectory. Most of the poor patients have an increased number of zero, and the dead patient have a lot of zero. So we started to think about the effect of having and 10 increase uh, uh, frequencies of MPI pathological looking at the poor neurological outcome in six months. And as you can see, there is a, a relationship. There is an effect size in which the odd of having a poor outcome increase spending time every time you spend over the three. And having three compare not going below three, as you can see, the risk is much higher. But we think about the trajectory and so, we say, if we go below, below three, we have a problem here. If we go to zero, the problem, looking at the hazard, is much higher, 12 times higher than a normal MPI. But being, having patient that has been treated, we were able to look at the trajectory. If the patient wasn't able to recover after two exams, to concomitant an exam one after the other, the risk of having a negative outcome remained there. But if a doctor in the four hours were able to revert this problem, return back uh, higher than zero, the risk returned back to a normal risk around 1.3, so it's much 10 times lower. And uh, the other point is the patient that has a deterioration and an increase of risk. So we are able to define some trajectory. And I think the main message here is that uh, three and zero are, are not definitive value. 
are an important alarm, like your patient having a low arterial pressure, like going in 60. Doesn't mean that he's going to die, but there is a huge relationship between 60 of pressure and dying. But if you are able to revert it, the situation could go better. So we explore also the association with ICP, and we see that uh, there was a higher number of uh, high ICP when the MPI was pathological, but we were not able to describe the story that Ma Ma Mauro depicted in his paper. So going to the conclusion, we are 30 seconds, and uh, abnormal MPI was associated with mortality and poor neurological outcome in our study, and uh, could be a predictor of disease trajectory. The message here is that when you have a low MPI that is more frequent when ICP is high, you need to treat the patient and you can revert this problem. And I think we, we can start thinking about using this standardized approach more broadly in our unit. And uh, I think that uh, added in the discussion we will have today about multimodality monitoring and so on could be an helpful tool at the best side for treating our patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. I think we have time for one question from the audience. If we have no questions. Yeah. I might, can I put you on the spot and ask you, do you use pupillometry in uh, neurological determination of, of death examination? I, I've never, so I don't think it's been validated. I've seen a creep of it getting used. And I suppose I always think of it like CTA versus uh, nuclear medicine imaging. Well, it's probably much more sensitive. Uh, uh, I, we discussed yesterday this topic in another, oh, in another session. I think uh, that uh, pupillometry giving you some trends is a useful tool understanding what's going on. I'm not using it for saying MPI is zero is a patient is going to die because you need all the other characteristics of a patient uh, that uh, are not able to breathe and so on. But there is for sure a relationship between pupils and the deterioration of a patient. So I use it uh, clinically, it's used uh, frequently by our nurses, uh, not hourly, but um, at least every two or three hours. And in the patient with a, a path going to brain death and deterioration, the pupils uh, examination is useful and uh, also pupillometry could help us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Shanika Ho uh, williams Hoberson from Vanderbilt University in Nashville, US. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am going to talk to you about uh, the question of whether EEG could be used more widely in the ICU. Um, I would like to acknowledge my sources of uh, funding who have no influence over the work that I will show you here today. So first I'll talk a little bit about the current indications for uh, EEG in the ICU, and then I'd like to spend a little bit of time discussing uh, one particular uh, way in which we think that it could be used in the future. Currently, uh, most of the indications for EEG in the ICU are all around uh, management of seizures or epilepsy. Either you have a patient with status epilepticus uh, who, and you want to uh, monitor their uh, response to treatment. Uh, perhaps you have a patient with altered mental status or coma, and you're not sure whether or not they have seizures, but you need to diagnose non-convulsive status epilepticus or non-convulsive seizures. Uh, you may have a patient who is completely awake and interactive but has intermittent uh, episodes that are concerning for seizure and you want to uh, use it for differential diagnosis. And then of course, if your patient did have status epilepticus and was not actually responding to your, uh, your treatments and you needed to put them into uh, uh, an anesthetic coma, for example, you may need to monitor, them, monitor their depth of sedation. There's, of course, the uh, possibility that someone has known seizures, um, again, is back to, uh, back to baseline and it's their first time seizure, uh, and yet you want, so you want to get a sense for what their uh, risk of going on, having ongoing seizures are, is, and so you might want to do an epilepsy risk stratification. Um, what we do not uh, currently do, uh, that we did in the past, was uh, some neuroprognostication after, after cardiac arrest, uh, although there are some uh, signs on the EEG 
that are suggestive of poor outcomes versus good outcomes. The, the current guidelines, at least according to the American Academy of Neurology, do not suggest uh, using uh, EEG for neuroprognostication uh, anymore. And then there's also the possibility of monitoring in the context of someone who is on sedation for, for example, targeted temperature management, but that is obviously falling uh, out of use as well. So those are, now that we've looked a little bit at the current indications, I want to uh, bring your attention to potential new indications, of which there are many, uh, many that have been in the pipeline for, for years. But in particular, I am uh, interested in uh, the use of EEG for delirium monitoring. And, and this can be, I think, most most uh, applicable initially in uh, sedated patients. So I'm going to give you a, a case presentation just as an example to start off with. Um, so 49-year-old woman comes to your uh, institution uh, with bacterial pneumonia and septic shock. Initially, upon presentation, she's neurologically intact, uh, but she is febrile, she is desaturating, and she requires mechanical ventilation. Um, she is sedated uh, with propofol for, for comfort and for uh, vent synchrony, um, and she started on antibiotics. By hospital day four, she, her respiratory parameters have improved. She's weaned from the propofol, um, and she's noted to be arousable but somnolent. Uh, she doesn't follow commands. She's inattentive, and she's intermittently agitated. She's all over the place. Um, in this case, what do you do? You get a neurologic, uh, you get a, a neuro consult, and neurology comes and says, "Hey, this woman's all over the place. Let's get her a head CT." Head CT is normal. Let's also get her an EEG. This is an example of a typical EEG you might see. If I were reading this for you, I'd probably, if I'd summarize, say that there is some uh, generalized excessive delta activity with, um, with some triphasic peering away forms that, um, that are nonspecific, maybe suggestive of sepsis or metabolic etiology or, or so on and so forth, hypoxemia, et cetera. Um, so this is, of course, ICU delirium, uh, which is a clinical presentation of an acute encephalopathy that's, that's characterized by fluctuating levels of arousal and attention and reduced awareness. Um, it happens in probably about a third of ICU admissions, depends on what population you're studying it in and what tool you're using to measure ICU delirium. Um, and it uh, has multiple risk factors, both predisposing as well as uh, precipitating risk factors, for example, sepsis or sedation as, as in the case of our patient. ICU delirium is costly. Uh, it, we've known for decades now, for probably 20 years, that it is independently predicts mortality, uh, long-term costs of care, uh, ICU uh, length of stay, mechanical ventilation requirement, et cetera, and of course, long-term cognitive impairment. Um, and importantly, for your patients that after you wean them from sedatives and they're persistently delirious, each day of additional delirium uh, is, is asso independently associated on adjusted analysis with 14% uh, or 13%, excuse me, increased risk for uh, mortality at the one year time point. So this is important. Um, and, and my question to you is, did we know about this? Could we have known about this earlier? Um, how can we predict delirium and identify it among those patients who are sedated in the ICU who may be, um, for whom maybe the bedside exam is a little bit confounded by the sedation? So this is a, a, a problem that our team sought to attack. Um, th we uh, specifically wanted to look at whether there were objective neurophysiologic signatures that we could identify of the signatures of ICU delirium that, that could reflect its underlying neural processes and kind of predict uh, outcomes, either short-term or long-term, and these being independent of sedation. This is a non-trivial factor because uh, the changes that you see in EEG can, by a machine, be confused with changes, uh, you know, associated with sleep or or or, or sedation itself, for example. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And before I go on, I want to just make it clear that I'm not advocating that everyone 
you know, order continuous EEG monitoring for all of their patients who are mechanically ventilated and sedated. I'm not about to tell you that. Um, I do not think that our healthcare systems can uh, support that, and I, and I don't uh, think that it would be helpful for our patients. Um, but with some tweaks to our healthcare systems and some advances, I think that there, there may be a possibility of, of, of offering, offering these to, to our patients. So what did we do to, uh, to investigate this? Um, we undertook a uh, nested study within uh, a couple of the ongoing prospective multi-center, uh, uh, sorry, prospective uh, single-center uh, cohort uh, studies that the uh, our center was uh, performing to uh, recruit 25 patients who were on mechanical ventilation. We uh, excluded folks who already had known uh, seizures or, uh, or major, focal, major focal structural anomalies on their, EEG, on their, excuse me, on their brain, on their head CTs or MRIs, for example. Uh, we performed 24-hour continuous EEG on these participants as they underwent uh, uh, delirium assessments twice daily, so an average of two, two uh, assessments per participant uh, using the confusion assessment method for the ICU. We then collected those EEG um, uh, recordings, specifically the segments right around five minutes after any of the CAM ICU assessments to pick pick the time that the patient was at their most uh, most aroused, most alert if possible. Uh, we pre-processed the CEG, removed uh, artifact, et cetera, and then we uh, undertook signal decomposition to sort of uh, computer, uh, to in a, in a quantifiable way, um, identify uh, portions of the EEG, the, the, the composition in, uh, that is contributing to it in uh, different frequency ranges, how those frequency ranges change over time, how different areas of the brain may be connected to one another, et cetera. Uh, we then uh, we use the excuse me multi, uh, we use single uh, imputation to uh, identify the uh, to fill in the blanks if you will for for a few of our, our segments that were missing and then we used a penalized regression model to essentially uh, identify of all of the several metrics that we had uh, computed which ones might actually contribute to a model of of delirium in these in these participants. We then uh, built that model uh, in addition to the clinical variables and compared it to a clinical-only model to uh, identify delirium or coma in, in these participants and then compared the models using a likelihood ratio test. So we enrolled, I'm going to go a little bit faster, we enrolled uh, 28 patients of whom 25 actually underwent continuous EEG monitoring, so for a total of 50 assessments. Um, they broke down approximately one third of them had uh, no delirium and then about two thirds of them had delirium or, or coma. Um, and then um, of those about 20, uh, 20 assessments were done on sedation. Here is just a smattering of the four uh, I, uh, four metrics that were identified on the EEG. I won't go into details about them, but basically these are, uh, the most prominent one actually was the delta variability, which is essentially the amount to which the uh, slow frequency varies over time. Um, and then what we did was uh, create in a post hoc analysis a uh, composite indicator based on these four uh, metrics uh, and tested that indicator initially on the on the initial cohort to uh, to see if it even you know d uh, identified delirium how well it identified delirium in that initial cohort and uh, it certainly had uh, passed the sniff test that it had an area under the curve of about 90 93.7 uh, percent in the uh, receiver operator characteristic curve. We also looked at the, inner, inner, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, we had done 24-hour EEGs, but we only took five-minute segments, uh, and we uh, used that, uh, looked at the entire, the indicator over the entire 24-hour uh, segments and, and identified that uh, it was stable over the diurnal cycle uh, with higher values among those individuals who did not uh, develop delirium or coma and lower values among those uh, individuals who did de develop delirium or coma. Um, interestingly, and, and were persistently, excuse me, in delirium or coma. So this black line, this black dotted line that you see here actually represents a participant who uh, on the morning assessment was normal, was chem ICU negative, and on the evening assessment was um, identified to have um, delirium. Uh, 
uh, our reviewers actually asked for a, a, another post hoc analysis indicating identifying the um, the uh, rel uh, relationship of our indicator to uh, a, a three month um, mortality outcomes and and you can, as you can see there it, it in univariate analysis it was uh, suggests it was uh, different for the two. Uh, we also underwent validation in a separate cohort. This was a cohort of hospitalized nonagenarians. This was a retrospective cohort of about 74 participants. And uh, the EEG delirium indicator did perform well overall in adjusted analyses. Uh, these folks were different from our original cohort because they were obviously older. Uh, our original cohort was uh, on average age about 60. Uh, and the uh, uh, EEG delirium indicator um, was uh, oh, also the uh, additional cohort had a history of dementia, uh, uh, quite a few of them had a history of dementia, which was not the case, which it was an exclusion criteria for our original cohort. Uh, uh, upon further, I, uh, I guess, details look at our uh, validation cohort, what we noted was that the area under the receiver operating curve was actually best in those without history of dementia and actually performed very poorly uh, in those with a history of dementia, as you can see in panel C over there. So I want to take it back a little bit because I showed you uh, some, pre some preliminary data that suggests that EEG can be used as an indicator of delirium at the time of the EEG recording um, and during that 24-hour period. But what about projecting whether delirium is going to happen after the patient is weaned from sedation? So this is just a post hoc analysis of that those original data. We followed those patients out to the point at which those patients who were on sedation uh, out until the point where they were actually weaned and looked at those who were persistently delirious after weaning versus those who were not. And as you can see, at least preliminarily, also my p-value is not on my graph, but, uh, but there is a, uh, there is a, a, a statistical significant, statistically significant difference uh, with higher uh, values indicating healthier brains uh, in folks who are uh, not delirious. So, so uh, with in summary, our key takeaway is basically that automated EEG can augment our delirium monitoring uh, in our ICU patients with and without sedation. Um, and I want to just give a couple seconds to the practical limitations, as I mentioned to you before. I don't think that we, we are currently in a state where we can go out and put continuous EEG monitoring, full montages on every participant in the ICU who's undergoing mechanical ventilation and sedation. Um, that would completely overwhelm our resources. and. <clears throat> both from a technical and a, uh, a professional standpoint. Um, I think what we need are automated um, automated signal processing with uh, with uh, with limited montage EEGs that can be ideally uh, recorded wirelessly and uh, connected to uh, connected to systems that you would be able to follow uh, long term. And so that's something that we're going to be working on in future future studies. In addition to assuring generalizability with a pro prospective cohort validation um, and and just working on ways to make this continuous monitoring a pragmatic reality. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. I think we have time for a question or two. Yep, have you? Uh, th thanks a lot, really, for the very nice data. I have a question. Most of the data that we present in EG are based on, you know, uh, let's say baseline registration without stimulation of the patient. I was. Uh, Considering, do you think that as some of the effect on the EG background on the manipulation are also influenced by sedation? Do you think that making a stimulation a specific time point and trying to quantify the reactivity of the G, whatever you define it, might add some additional information to the way that we understand on brain dysfunction in these patients? Certainly, I th think that's an excellent, uh, excellent point. Um, so the way that we uh, approached this study was to actually initially look at the EEG specifically when the patient was at their most stimulated to try to try to get their their best, if you will, brain activity. Um, looking at the change from pre-stimulation to post-stimulation is essentially the um, is the f uh, fundamental aspect behind what's what's called EEG background reactivity. Um, and that, if anything, has been I identified by Andrea Rossetti and others as um, one of the most predictive, um, most, most, I guess, 
salient aspects of the EEG that predicts uh, both current health and long-term outcomes. So I think absolutely. There's also studies uh, currently by, say, Stephanie Blaine Morales and, and folks in the uh, coma um, coma recovery sort of space that are looking at um, trying to stimulate the brain in other ways, for example, with um, adding uh, what's the brain's uh, response to uh, sedative, you know, anesthetic and how it comes out of, and you know, how it re recovers from anesthesia and such like that. So absolutely. Great. Any more questions? So how heavily did you um, um, take artifacts out? Because I can imagine that if you have a, yeah, agitated patient, maybe the EEG shows a lot of artifacts, and that's going to uh, that's make going to you compromise. Different. Yes, absolutely. That certainly can compromise the uh, problems, and we spend a lot of uh, time and thought into how to uh, how to remove artifacts. There are some art, art, automated artifact algorithm uh, removal algorithms that are getting more and more um, you know get, that are getting better and better these days I was at first very skeptical about them but you know sort of testing them on on some of our own data and comparing them to our manually manually curated uh, data sets they, they turned out to be pretty well we're using uh, in for this study we did a combination of automated filtering as well as sort of manually reviewing the EEGs to make sure that we are pulling out artifact, but not pulling out too much of the EEG, if you will. Um, but then we've been able to, in, in later recordings, go back and compare with some of the more recent um, artifact reduction uh, uh, algorithms that are out there. Um, and they're performing pretty well. Using independent components analysis, they're even able to sometimes recreate the original EEG, kind of like look through the, the muscle artifact and, and recreate. But in these cases, most of our participants, participants had hypoactive delirium. Um, there, was a, there was a minority of hyperactive delirium anyway. Great. Could, I, I just have one quick question, actually. So your long-term monitoring, I think you said was for 24 hours. Can I ask, what is the limited amount of period of time you would need for your automated uh, DI to actually work? Um, so that only required, that we took five minute segments. Okay. Um, so yes, it, it would not require a, a, a full 24 hours, obviously. Um, there were, I, my goal was to gather as much data as possible and I was sending an EEG technician to the bedside to put, you know, 19 electrodes on the head. I wanted to get as much as possible and maybe, maybe be able to use it. Um, there are some devices out there these days that you can sort of like, just kind of place on the head, and um, and um, and there is even one that allows for uh, delirium or or risk of delirium detection, if you will, um, in a sort of a 90-second time frame. But again, it requires someone to go and put, position the patient and put it on their head and and such. So great, much more uh, real-time applicable. Five yes, minutes, absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker up is Professor uh, Fabio Tacconi from Belgium, and he's going to be talking about non-invasive assessment of brain compliance. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Good afternoon to everyone. So uh, this is the title of my lecture, Conflict of Interest, which are not related to the lecture today for once. Uh, so uh, I have some uh, introduction. So um, we talked today about neuromonitoring, and you know that the global approach to patients with acute brain injury is basically clinical examination combined with imaging to understand the extent of brain lesions, so whether there is a correlation of severity of lesions with the severity of the clinical alteration. And I think that besides any neuromonitoring, we have to remind to everyone that we need a clinical examination. It's very important. We can take a lot of information from this clinical examination, but of course there are limits. I don't know if there are many neurologists in the room, but I can assure that not only the non-neurologist intensivists can do a very full clinical exa examination, which will take time. And what I like to remind to my colleagues is that even when the patient is deteriorating or is immediately severe at the presentation, you know that there is a problem, but you still don't know which is the mechanisms behind, behind the problem because the degradation, the worsening of the patient is not specific to seizure, is not specific to intracranial hypertension, is not specific to hyponatremia. You just see the patient deteriorating. So sometimes it's, of course, a very good point to start with, but it's not the final answer, in particular if you want to drive decision-making at the bedside. So 
why we should care about brain compliance? Because when you know, I talk with people and say why the patient is, uh, is worsening, uh, people say, okay, if I control all the systemic variables, sodium, hemoglobin, oxygen, then I think something going, is going on into the brain of this patient. And I put it in red, most of people think about what we call intracranial hypertension. There is a pressure into the skull, you know, this patient is going high, and if it goes high, it will impair brain perfusion. Of course, there are a bunch of other potential other mechanisms that are involved into this, which are very complicated to monitor, by the way. But I would say that in particular for trauma, traumatic brain injury, intracranial hypertension remains one of the most common reasons for neuro worsening in these patients. Now, what we do in this case is that we discuss most of the Western uh, Europe countries, North America, we will go for an ICP monitor because we are afraid of the increase of the pressure into the skull. And of course, the best way to see whether the pressure is high is to measure it as we do. For example, for patients with shock, we want to measure continuously blood pressure in these cases. These are the indications. This is the, the placement of the catheters. But despite that this, this remains, I would say, probably the routine approach in most of the severe patients uh, having an acute brain injury, you know, when you look at the evidence behind whether ICP and CP-driven therapy change uh, the outcome of the patients, what we have today in terms of randomized trials remain this trial conducted in South America, where patients were randomized to ICP-driven therapy or uh, clinics and CT imaging, repeated once, driving therapy, which showed that, you know, looking just at statistics, you don't see an effect of this ICP-driven therapy. I don't want to discuss the methodological issues, the setting of this trial, there are very nice editorial being made. But one of the questions that come repeatedly is that when you put a catheter and you measure a pressure and you treat these patients based on a value of a threshold, you will oversimplify a very complex biological mechanism. So if you say that ICP is elevated since XC20, which means your patient is dying at 21, is a very nice, okay, at 19, of course, you can easily understand, doesn't make any sense in your clinical practice. And the problem that is behind this concept of ICP-driven therapy is that we need to make a protocol to use a threshold. And this is one of the criticisms that has been also raised by Randy Chesnut, which is the one, the PI of this best ICP trial, because, of course, the value that you are going to measure doesn't give you exactly the explanation which are the effect of that level of ICP on my individual patient. And so that's where brain compliance comes to, to a head up. So I think Ari is here at the, at the chair, he's a get expert on ventilation. I mean, compliance is part of the assessment of RDS patients since many years. And you know that it's this relationship between pressure and volume. So if I translate this to the skull, which is of close, closed one with the brain inside, you might have some patients, you know, like uh, I hope myself now, where there is a good equilibrium between volume and pressure inside, and my pressure will be quite low. My brain is quite compliant. So if I get angry, I start to shut out, my blood pressure goes up, my compliance will remain normal because there are uh, compensatory mechanisms that keep this pressure normal inside my skull. If I get an acute brain injury, of course, this relationship can start to be altered because the compensatory mechanism is altered because there is a mass effect into the skull and you start to have this volume pressure dependent zone, which is a reduced compliance. Here, you have some compensatory mechanism that start to be effective. What we can do to compensate? Well, we reduce some of the component of the intra cerebral um, volume. So basically you can squeeze the CSF towards the basis of the skull or towards the perimedullary space, or you reduce the venous volume, the, the volume of blood contained into the veins, into the brain. This is the best way the brain have to compensate for an alteration of compliance. Of course, you may easily understand in some situation, this uh, altered uh, PV relationship start to be even more uh, disturbed. Uh, you can have a minimal compliance situation in general, very, very high ICP, and then you can go up to the collapsed macrocirculation, which precedes brain death. And of course, the more severe the brain injury, the highest is this alteration of compliance. So basically, if I have an ICP alone, well, if your ICP is 10, you have high probability you are there. If your ICP is 50, you have high probability you are there. The point is that most of our patients at the bedside, when we start to do therapies, are within 15 and 25. And guess what? 
most of the cases you are here. You don't know whether your level of ICP is within good compliance or high compliance, which means that if you are in a situation of reduced compliance, each small changes in one of the variables that drive the equilibrium of the brain, brain homeostasis, will change brain compliance, will potentially bring the patients from this phase to this phase with high, huge impairment of brain perfusion. Now, of course, brain compliance can complement ICP, and there are some ways that in the past we have evaluated brain compliance. I recommend you to read a manuscript from Giuseppe and Marek Chosnika, 2012 ICM, which said uh, that's the way that we discuss brain compliance and etc. all the limitation of this. It's going there, it's going forward alone, I don't know why. So one way to analyze the brain compliance is to add to the brain some volume or to remove some value with CSF and say, okay, if I calculate the pressure before and after heavy manipulating the CSF into the brain, I can try to estimate this index, which is a, an approximation of the brain compliance. The point is that you are just manipulating CSF and then this is quite invasive. You need an ICP monitor and you need to withdraw or inject some CSF. So we do actively manipulate the patients with all the complications we might have to uh, 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 touch on the catheters into the brain. And why this? Because of course you have the pressure, but you cannot have the volume into the brain. So you cannot calculate compliance without manipulating actively, as I told you, this equilibrium into the skull. Now, if you want to see why brain compliance is uh, at the bedside interesting, you might consider that what you want to know is whether the patient is in this part of the curve. You don't, are not interested to say whether it's a little bit altered or not. You want to, to know whether, sorry, it's going up, up below, if this system is in this part of the curve, is the compensated part. And how to recognize this? Well, you, know, you need to understand which are the impact of altered compliance on the brain. They might occur at the level of the supertentorial areas. It's a reduced, global reduced of CBF. It might occur at the CSF outflow, for example, enlargement of the optic nerve, or this might just translate into an herniation of the upper part to the lower part with alteration of brainstem. So there are different windows you might use to try to estimate the effect of alteration and compliance on different brain function. And to do this, you can use non-invasive monitoring. One way you use transcranial Doppler. Transcranial Doppler measures CBF velocities, not CBF, but when ICP is going up, if the compensatory mechanism are exhausted, you will start to observe what? A decrease of diastolic pressure first, and an increase of this post-satellite index, which is a surrogate of the equilibrium between systolic, diastolic, and mean pressure. This has been repeatedly shown. This is a, a graph coming from, from Grenoble, from Pierre Bouza group, showing that when ICP goes up, diastolic velocity is reduced, and PI is increased with the patients who is clinically deteriorating at the bedside. And this is a very old paper trying to combine compliance measured invasively with a very sophisticated approach and just a Doppler showing that when you have a, a B-way plateau of ICP, which is a prolonged alteration of ICP significantly impair CPP and brain flow, you will observe a progressively decrease in, uh, in the flow measured at the level of TCD. So TCD might be a surrogate of analysis of alteration of brain compliance with a significant impact on brain perfusion. This is at the level of CBF. So we want to look at the brainstem. You have to look at the upper part of brainstem, which is the mesencephalon, and the best way to do it is use the pupils. Uh, Giuseppe mentioned this study. This study is a study looking at pupillometry from the Lausanne group Maurodo, patients with cranial hypertension. You have already seen this graph, very nice. ICP goes up, NPI goes down, even before ICP exceeds 20, and then when you give therapy, the MPI goes back to baseline values. What's very interesting to me is that you see the variance of the values cross the median one, which means that it's not because ICP is going up that all the MPI values will be altered. ICP can be associated with the normal pupillary function or with alteral pupillary function, which means that according to the patient level, that value of ICP of 20 might be yes or no associated with brainstem dysfunction, limiting again the absolute value of ICP 
at the population level when we consider what we do at the individual level. It has been confirmed in this trial from US where they show, okay, we give a manital therapy, we measure MPI, and we see that MPI is a little bit decreased thereafter. But this was particularly true for those patients where the baseline MPI was altered, which means you have an ICP elevating, you have an alteration of the pupils. Of course, if you treat ICP and you um, bring compliance towards normal values, you will see an improvement of pupillary function. The same could be for CSF outflow, which is surrounding the optic nerve, and you can evaluate at the bedside, if you're a little bit skilled, this, the diameter of the optic sh sheet, di um, sheet uh, diameter, I was saying. This is, of course, nicely correlated with ICP, but again, what is interesting to me is that the correlation is not perfect. This is logical. You might have a patient with ICP of 20, which is a minimal effect on compliance, so optic nerve sheet diameter is normal, and the patients with 20 ICP where the huge, where the effect on the CSF outflow is huge. So again, this shows us that using non-invasive neuromonitoring, we can understand that that patient of ICP of 20 has no problem with compliance probably, and this one has a problem in brain compliance. And what is very interesting to me is that all this measurement can be easily let's say, corrected by a therapy. So if there is an alteration of uh, ONSD, you give back mannitol and you see that together with ICP, these in all, all patients go towards normal values. I will briefly touch on the ICP waveform because I think Gert is going to discuss more, more about this. So uh, just to tell you that ICP waveforms can give you an idea of alteration in brain compliance because you will see basically that there is a changes between the ratio between the P1 and DP2 waveforms. I will not go into detail just to go in overlap with GERT, but just to tell you that now it's possible at the bedside to have a device which is not available officially in Europe yet. It's a Brazilian device that is able to estimate the waveform of ICP non-invasively. So just measuring this at the level of the skull. And it's been validated with ICP and ICP waveforms measured invasively with a very nice um, uh, uh, precision in calculating the P2 to P1 ratio, which is again a surrogate of alteration of brain compliance in this setting. So you see that non-invasively we can just assess ICP waveforms, even without ICP waveforms directly measurement with a catheter, and still obtain a P2 to P1 ratio, which is again a surrogate of brain compliance. So go directly to the last point of the presentation to conclude how we can use all this. Well, it could be a triage system. I have a patient who is deteriorating, I don't have ICP. I can have a different approach looking at all the different windows that suggest this patient has an altered compliance to understand whether this brain is at risk of herniation of hypoperfusion. You might say that the patient is deteriorating. If all these measurements are normal, you are much less nervous than if these alterations are present because you want to give immediately therapy before ICP is measured. If ICP is present, you start to individualize care. This is a very nice paper published by Godoy and others talking about the syndrome of the intracerebral compartment syndrome. Basically, you have the ICP and you have the non-invasive neuromonitoring. So if everything is normal, level of ICP is there, you just wait and see. If you have a patient who has an ICP with, let's say, elevated 22, but all the neuromonitoring is normal, you might decide to wait and see or do additional investigation before giving therapy. You might. And of course, you have a situation where everything, you know, the ICP is altered and everything is altered, then you really want to treat as soon as possible. And there might be some situation where ICP is normal, but all these parameters are altered. Again, it questions whether the measurement of ICP is altered or maybe underline the limitation of all these monitoring tools. So these are my conclusions. As mass on brain compliance provide information on brain homostasis of an acute brain injury. Non-invasive assessment of compliance is possible. All these are surrogate of brain compliance. And the multimodal approach using pupils, ONSD, and the TCD can give a global view on brain homostasis that complement the SCP value. Potential application are triage, patients at risk of brain complication, or individualized ICP therapy to better decide at which level of ICP aggressively treat our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Fabio. Questions from the audience? No. Just a quick one. How can we do trials assessing? You know Bonanza, we have all the problems we like. How can we do trials to assess the impact of this type of monitoring? Well, I think that, again, if you have more monitoring system, 
it complexified the approach because you need to train people. Everyone can measure ICP at the, on the monitoring and start the therapy, yes, no. But when you add all this monitoring system, of course, you need to train people and you complexify the protocols. So that's, to me, the main limitation. And again, I think that before doing a protocol with an intervention, we still need to better describe more than a single center, small course study, which are the effect of different therapies on all these monitoring system. And just basically, are we able in the phase one pro concept study to demonstrate that you are able to treat adequately and reverse all these abnormalities? But we have to demonstrate first feasibility. I think like in you know, auto regulations be done very nicely for cogitative feasibility. When after this, you, you can maybe go for a, for a trial where you try to individualize care according to ICP or non-invasive monitoring accordingly. Yeah. Questions? Big? Yeah. I don't know. I, maybe more of a practical question for the audience. When you use this because either, well, you go for the non-invasive approach, how often would you get your team to reassess? Would you be doing this hourly or what is a practical application of this? So this is a very good point because uh, most of these measurements need to be repeated. So it takes time, uh, resources. Uh, it depends a lot probably on the patients. If your measurement is normal and the patient's very severe, we generally do uh, you know, an, an global assessment every two to four hours. If you have measurement which are altered, may you want to repeat every hour or if you do intervention after the intervention. So according to the severity of the patients and your intensity of care, you might increase or decrease the number of observations, which of course I didn't discuss how much resources all this will consume in terms of you know, uh, medical no, uh, people at the bedside. Uh, that's another issue. Great. Thanks so much. Questions? No. Okay. Thank you very much for having so our next speaker is Gert Meifrod to talk about uh, ICP waveforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. And indeed, um, a lot of my, what my talk will be will, will be um, following on, on what Fabio has already said on intracranial compliance, because indeed this is what it's all about. So we measure ICP. Why do we measure ICP? On the one hand, we want to avoid the big disaster of a patient who is herniating with an excessive ICP that is very high. Uh, and on the lower end, we want to, because we know that increased ICP can, uh, can cause uh, hyperperfusion locally or globally of the brain. So we want to avoid secondary injury. And, and what is very important, because uh, an ICP is, is, is a number, is, is, is a measurement of a pressure, but what we want to uh, address is also the intracranial compliance. So we want to know, and from a single value of ICP, as, as Fabio just told, from a single value of ICP, it's very hard to know uh, where you are at the level of intracranial uh, compliance. Uh, even, and even so, even while we know that guidelines on treating ICP still use these values, they still say it's, there's a single value above which your patient needs to be treated and below which, I don't know, you can be uh, relaxed. And these values are simply based on epidemiology. They're based on the fact that on average, patients with ICPs above these levels do worse than other patients. But those are not treatment thresholds. Those are epidemiological data. This doesn't mean we have to treat at these values as the guidelines seem to suggest. And we know that being above elevated ICP for a long time is harmful. So uh, this is something we've shown and that has later been reproduced in, uh, in Cambridge and also uh, in the Center TBI database. So a long uh, episode above elevated ICP is actually uh, harmful. So when we talk about intracranial compliance, because I've been asked to talk uh, to tell you about waveforms, so how long have we known that there are waveforms? Well, actually, early uh, physiological papers, this is a paper from the uh, 19th century, where uh, a, 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 a man who had a, a previous uh, brick that fell on his head, so he had a cranial defect, which allowed the investigators to measure um, the, the volume of his brain and also the changes, and they could see pulsatility in that. So they could see pulsatility in that, and actually it has been quite controversial where that uh, pulsatility came from, and it was not until the end of the 60s with the physiological studies that it was found that the, major, the major pulsation in cerebrospinal fluid actually comes from the arterial pulsation. There is a venous component in that, and um, in conditions where the arterial pressure is decreased, this venous component becomes more prominent, but most of what we see in the pulsations, so in the 
uh, waveform of the uh, ICP is uh, concerned with arterial pulsations because the onset co coincides with the arterial pulses and uh, the respiratory variations that we see in uh, spinal fluids are reflected in right atrium and in central aortic pressures. And I think we know, uh, or, or the, the first people who actually um, studied waves uh, or studies time series of ICP measurement, uh, like for instance Lundberg, who was a pioneer in this, um, has, has found these characteristics, slower waves or slow variation, which I think you all know. So the slow wave, formerly known as Lundberg B waves, they don't appear when the ICP is low and stable, but as the ICP starts to increase, you see more of these slow uh, waves with um, um, with, with an amplitude of zero, uh, with, with a frequency of 0 0.3 to 3 uh, per minute. They're actually vasogenous and they're probably um, responses to spontaneous variations in blood pressure. The amplitude of these slow uh, waves is in general uh, very low. We have the large Lundberg A waves, which are uh, higher um, excursions of ICP lasting for uh, longer and paradoxically who have been associated with good outcome, which is um, simply because of their pathophysiology, because these Lundberg A waves typically occur when autoregulation works, because how does it occur? You have a small drop in blood pressure, autoregulation will vasodilate the vessels, which reflect itself in a rise in ICP in a condition of limited pressure volume reserve and a drop in CPP. When autoregulation intact, what will happen? You will see an, uh, a vasoconstriction in response and the wave will, uh, will diminish and drop uh, again. And then uh, finally, there's the respiratory waves, the Lundberg C waves, spontaneous uh, variations with, uh, with ventilation uh, that actually are normal and that will decrease or even disappear when the ICP uh, increases. So those are the slower waves, but what about the pulses? What about the pulses of the ICP? Are they actually informative? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I had this patient in my unit. Uh, it was, was a tragic case of a young uh, a guy who was hit, um, who, who, had, who had a bicycle accident. It was actually one of the best friends of my youngest son, so it was very close to me, this case. But when we put him uh, under sedation and ICP monitoring, he had a severe TBI. We noticed that his ICP remained low with this uh, morphology, but it was not possible to wake him up. So as soon as you would stop sedation, the ICPs would go up very high. And of course, people who already know the literature and, and see the morphology will not be surprised of this. So what is a normal morphology of, an, uh, of a CSF pulse wave? Normally, you would see three pulses. So normally, you would see the reflection of the arterial pulse throughout uh, the brain, so this is the per what we call uh, the percussion wave. Then there's a tidal wave that we call P2, which is actually the propagation of the blood throughout the skull. And then when the aortic valve closes, we see the dichrotic notch also uh, reflected uh, in the brain. So this is what is, what is uh, normal. Now, if we come to a situation of intracranial hypertension, what you will typically see is that the P1 and P3 components become uh, more important, resulting in a change in the shape of this wave. And so this is an indication of reduced compliance. And actually you can categorize this because this will go progressively. So this is what you would expect normally, but in a potential pathological status, you will see that the P2 will start to rise. The dichrotic notch might still be at the same level, but if the P2 becomes larger than the P1, you should become suspicious. If both of them, P2 and P3, become higher than P1, this is very likely to be pathological like in this case of this friend of my uh, youngest son. Um, and clearly pathological is when they exceed them or when you can no longer see uh, the three pulses. And um, this is, you've seen this, this slide uh, uh, by, by Fabio as well, but you, this is where, uh, a very nice uh, paper by Sergio Brazil in intensive care medicine where you can actually see this, where you can see that as the as you go up on this curve, and I think this is very important and probably more important than the value, you will see the P1 uh, um, component become lower, P2 become disproportionately higher uh, until there's no uh, wave that you can uh, see, uh, the, until the whole shape of the wave uh, will change.
Now, have people uh, used that? Have people used that in their um, in, in clinical practice? Yeah, you can actually use this quite complex uh, methodology, which is called MOCAIP. MOCAIP was an algorithm originally designed for hydrocephalus patients, but you can uh, mathematically analyze the curve and then use this mathematical an analysis to predict ICP elevations. This is done by the group of uh, Paul Vespa, and up to 20 minutes in advance, you can actually see a raise in ICP coming based on this analysis, and even 35 minutes in advance, the, uh, the, 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 you, you see that sensitivity and specificity of the prediction is still uh, quite high. Fibe also mentioned that you can do this non-invasively, so you can also assess this non-invasively using this Brazilian device that is not uh, yet approved in Europe. And it's actually quite interesting that one of the developers was an engineer suffering from hydrocephalus who was told that it was impossible to uh, non-invasively measure the pressure in the skull. And he was an engineer and he thought this cannot be true. So he started challenging this. So he took a skull and he took a balloon and he started to put pressure in the balloon and measure the deformations of the skull. And he actually found that you can you can increase the pressure and there's a clear linear relationship with a skull uh, deformation. So he actually challenged the, the old Monroe Kelly doctrine that the skull is a closed box that will not deform. No, it will deform uh, at a scale that is detectable. And based on that, uh, they developed this technology, which is brain care, uh, where they had this headset and um, what is quite interesting is that it sees morphology. Now, what they do, what they did in the beginning was use this morphology to predict ICP. And I would argue that what they have is probably a more interesting parameter than the ICP value in say. So they do, we, why, why do they do this? Because we're used to measuring ICP. So we think that this new technology should somehow mimic ICP. But what it gives us is probably more interesting than the actual um, ICP uh, value. And this non-invasive assessment of these peaks actually corresponds very well to the invasive assessment. So this is where they compared both methods. Um, they also looked at the time to peak. The time to peak is less predictive than the P2, P1 ratio, but still predicted of um, elevated ICP. They also did this while they compressed the jugular vein um, and they found that the methods actually agreed uh, very well. So this is uh, another paper where both uh, methods uh, were compared and where you can see that to predict an ICP above uh, 20 millimeters of mercury, the P2, uh, P1 ratio is more predictive than the time uh, to peak. And you can see the numbers here, sensitivity and uh, specificity, sensitivity and especially negative predictive values are quite high. So interesting technique. Um, I think something we can do at the bedside, even without mathematical assessment, with an invasive ICP, we can look at it uh, at these ratios, and it's something actually we do quite well at the bedside. Is there something else in the pulse that we can look at? Yeah, we can also look at the amplitude of the pulse. What we will also see is that the amplitude of the pulse will change as the ICP increases. And so this is an index that was developed in Cambridge, which is called the regression of amplitude and pressure, or the RAP index, and it is a correlation uh, coefficient between changes in pulse amplitude and the mean intracranial pressure. And what should we, what do we expect uh, if we are in the flat part and we are actually in the, in the uh, high compliance part, you, you would expect no correlation between the two. So it means that uh, your pulse pressure is not yet influenced by intracranial pressure as what happens as I'm standing here. But as the compliance rises, um, as, as the compliance decreases and the, the curve rises, you see that the index will increase. And so this index will increase even up to one when there's a perfect correlation between amplitude and ICP. And then at the end of the curve, when uh, uh, comp compensatory reserve is exhausted, the index might even become negative. But then, of course, you have already detected that there's a problem um, in another uh, way. And this uh, RAP index uh, combined, so if you have an ICP in itself to predict outcome or 
you combine um, this with uh, with this uh, with this index, uh, the uh, prediction you actually get uh, better predictions of outcome. And this is now also integrated in the latest version of uh, ICM Plus, a software that is not a clinical software; it's research software uh, distributed by Cambridge. But you can also see this index uh, in this software. But it's something I think you can also look at at the bedside without uh, formal analysis. So um, this is my uh, last slide I think it's clear why this young patient had a problem here because you could see uh, the reduced compliance in his uh, in his waveform and that was a good reason not to try to wake him up because regardless of this low ICP value you could see that he was already st on the beginning of the steep curve of his uh, of his uh, compliance uh, curve. So ICP waveforms hold crucial uh, information. And even I, I would argue that in some instances, that more, it's more informative to look at compliance and waveform analysis than to look at the absolute uh, ICP value. It is something you can do. There are indexes, but most of them are in research software. So probably not available to clinicians, but this might come. Um, and um, with the brain for care system, you could also choose to monitor um, non-invasively in countries where they are available. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thanks very much. Do you have any questions from the audience? I'm going to start while everyone thinks. Um, you know, I really like that because we do our uh, bedside teaching all the time. I will pull out the waveform and try to teach our residents and fellows to appreciate that. And uh, we don't obviously use the research tool of RAP. It'd be nice to have an index, but I almost call it like a transitional zone between say 15 and 20, not believing in outright thresholds and try to get them to combine that waveform with the ICP. But my question to you is, are you ever tempted to start treating at that earlier, I call it transitional zone, rather than pulling the trigger at say 20 or 22, whatever yeah, that well, number we the, use? The thing is that we, uh, that we do treat them at as low. I mean, the guy was sedated, which is treatment, because otherwise, I mean, my normal patient is not sedated. So this is this is treatment. The question is, do I increase level? Do I move to sort of a next next tier of therapeutic intensity? Not necessarily. It would depend. But the way I see the the neuromonitoring or how we use it, it is. It's not a single number of ICP that will determine whether I will increase intensity of not, or not. I might be perfectly happy with an ICP of 21, and I might be very unhappy with an ICP of 17. It depends on the consequences of what happens. If I see, look, the, the guy's worsening, for instance. I see indexes of worsening, pupillometry, uh, um, waveform analysis, stuff that indicates that it's worsening, I might decide to treat or at least look at the patient and examine the patient. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's putting the puzzle together and not believing that a single piece of information will give you everything. Definitely not a single number of ICP, but realize which physiology you're addressing. We're addressing compliance. We see a problem with compliance because the curve is clearly abnormal. And no, because in this guy, the curve normalized. So it took about 10 to 12 days for it to normalize, after which we woke him up without any problem. Uh, we kept the ICP, and while we woke him up, there was no problem anymore. So I, but I think that's the idea. There is not a single piece of information that, that will give you, there's not a single number that gives you all the information. That's what I want to say. So put, it, put the whole puzzle together and try to think physiologically. Yeah. Anyone? Another follow-on for me would just be, at least where we work, there is uh, the staff physician tends to go home at night because we work 24 for seven days in a row. And um, I think when, you know what to look for if you know what to look for. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't, my juniors at night, I worry about the kind of technical complexity, especially in a neuro ICU, and how do I get them to understand it's not just the number and do the sophisticated uh, way that you're going to approach the patient for that that kid you're talking about to ensure they get 24 seven care, just like yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, and I think I think if we if we talk about AI or AI systems, I think it's gonna one of the things is going to be that it's going to be, we know that there's not enough ex top experts in an organ system, and I'm not top expert in other organ systems either. 
And so something that tells also to a non-expert, look, there's a problem here. Maybe not necessarily ringing a bell or whatever, but if you go to the bedside that it tells you, look, this, this curve is abnormal. You might, that even a non-expert can understand, okay, this is, this is, because now the people in this room know what to look at, but all the other, their colleagues will not know. And so if they try to, uh, if they can't be there 24-7. No. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Any other questions? Great, one at the front there. So here, thank you very much. Your example of the of the biker, huh, probably without a bicycle helmet. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And um, a bit drunk as well. <laughs> but um, is this not an example of that you should maybe kick in uh, the non-invasive monitoring? Huh? You say you don't yeah, completely understand, and should you not do an ONSD or whatever to, to, yeah, to um, be a bit more convinced about, okay, uh, leave this guy alone and uh, keep him sedated. And what do you mean, in, in addition or? Yes, in addition. Just what I think Fabio, uh, more or less. But uh, yeah, I think, I think additional, uh, it's, it's monitoring to me is not a fetish or anything. So I don't like, I don't want to put per se some probes in a, in, in a patient. It, it's about the physiology you want to address. That's the thing. The physiology here is compliance. The worry is in the end, herniation, he wasn't there yet, but perfusion problems may be suboptimal. So this patient was monitored with ICP, with PBTO2, and actually what we saw is that even small uh, changes in sedation or blood pressure would reduce his PBTO2. So he was at a critical point, even while his ICP was very low. And the curve actually gave away one of the clues. And it's one of the nicest examples that, I, that I've seen that, that you, you have, a, a, of course, in these young people, the CT is always full. So it is, I mean, he, he, was, he's, he was 21, so full CT, uh, very hard to assess from the, from the CT itself what the ICP will be. And the waveform gave away the additional uh, information. It, was, it wasn't the only information, it was a piece of the puzzle and it fitted with the rest of his physiology because if we manipulated something while he was that, still that critical, things went wrong and we had to resedate him. Thanks. Great, great, thank you so much, Thanks. Gert. Okay, we are moving on to our next speaker, Professor uh, Pierre Bouzat from France, who's gonna be talking to us about brain oxygen pressure for everyone. Thank you, Victoria. Um, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. So it's a pleasure to be part of the session and we're gonna talk about uh, invasive uh, measurement of brain oxygenation. So I don't have any conflict of interest regarding this presentation apart from being the last author of the OxyTC trial and the company provide uh, the probes for free uh, for this trial, but they have no role in conducting the trial. So, um, invasive, invasive brain tissue oxygenation is becoming the more common way to measure brain oxygenation at the bedside. And you can insert probe and using a clock method or optic method, you can measure uh, the brain oxygenation at the bedside. And obviously you only have a very small volume of parenchymas that is explored by this probe. And if you are not a believer of this technique, um, the question is whether the small changes you observed at the local, uh, uh, local um, area of the brain uh, mirror the entire modification that you can see into the brain. So even if it's very local, uh, I think the success of brain, uh, invasive brain tissue oxygenation is also the failure of over monitoring. And if you look at the nurse technique, we know that it's also local because it's all, uh, it explores the frontal lobes. It's also limitation, limitation in terms of extracranial contamination. And if you are using uh, venous jugular bulb oxygen saturation, it's also too global and could also be contaminated by extracranial uh, uh, blood. So I think this, this is the main reason uh, why brain tissue oxygenation monitoring uh, uh, is, getting, is getting more attention. So what about normal values? Normal value of brain tissue oxygenation have been established um, in the operating room. This is a patient uh, undergoing uh, neurosurgery. 
you can see that you have to wait before the stabilization of the uh, numbers, around two hours. And then the normal values is uh, higher than 20. It's around 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury for normal brain tissue oxygenation, normal PBTO2 values. How to interpret PBTO2? And I think the best relationship that was described in the literature was made by Rosenthal uh, and colleagues uh, more than 15 years ago. And PBT2 is proportional to the produce of CBS by the arterial venous uh, oxygen tension difference. So it means, in practical, that if you have a low PBT2 at the bedside, maybe you have a technical problem. Uh, the probe doesn't work, so you have to change the probe. Maybe the probe is inside a contusion, so you have to make a CT scan to look at where is uh, the probe. Maybe the patient is experiencing low CBF, so you have a reduction of oxygen delivery due to low CBF. Maybe you have low arterial oxygen content, a decrease in hemoglobin concentration, and decrease in PiO2, so you have to correct uh, these parameters. But it all could so be due to a low diffusion. It means that the oxygen cannot diffuse from the capillary into the brain carampima due to edema, and we don't have any specific therapy to, uh, to uh, improve uh, the diffusion. So where to put uh, the probe? Uh, ideally, we should put the probe in the tissue uh, that is at risk of uh, ischemia, but frankly, we don't know exactly where the tissue at risk is, and we don't have any bedside detection of this uh, uh, tissue. So the rule is to put the probe in the normal parenchyma, and using the probe in the normal parenchyma, then you maybe the variation in the regional CBF are well correlated to uh, the global CBF. We have nicely shown that in when I was in Lausanne. We look at the CBF around the probe, the regional CBF, and we try to make the correlation between the global CBF, and you can see that the correlation is quite good. So I think this is one of the main reasons why we put the catheter in normal parenchyma. How to assess its functionality, so maybe you can do an IFIO2 challenge, you increase the IFIO2 and the PBO2 increase between 100 and 300 percent. Uh, it's in that the probe is functional. PBO2 is a diagnostic tool, it's a monitoring tool, so you want to diagnose something. So the first step is maybe to diagnose a low CBF at the bedside. It was um, a figure from the same study I presented before. Um, you can see that when you add PBTO2 to ICP, you increase the accuracy to, decrease, to detect uh, low CBF. Putting uh, CMD does not add much information, but PBTO2 really had a lot compared to ICP alone in terms of detection of low CBF. Another point is that really interesting to look also at the magnitude of the PBTO2 variation due to PIO2 variation. Each line is a patient. You can see that we change his PIO2 and we look at the variation in PBTO2. And according to different CBF, you can see that the slope of the line is different. So looking at the magnitude of PBTO2 variation according to PIO2 variation, gives you an information about the regional CBF as well. This was shown uh, 15 years ago. You can see here the relationship between PBTO2 value and CBF. When the CBF is low, PBTO2 is low. And when you increase the oxygen you, during the FIO2 challenge, you can see that the oxygen reactivity is lower in region with low CBF compared to region with high CBF. So also, the magnitude of the response to FIO2 challenge gives you an information about uh, the CBF. What about uh, the relationship between CPP and PBTO2? In this recent paper, you can see with high resolution uh, data, you can see that variation of CPP induces variation of PBTO2. This is the whole cohort, and they were able to distinguish two different types of uh, uh, brain injuries patient with a preserved uh, oxygen uh, reactivity, meaning that you modify CPP, but there is no PBO2 variation, and some patient with uh, an altered oxygen reactivity, meaning that the CPP directly affected the value of the PPTO2 linear, almost linearly. 
What about the uh, prognostic uh, value of PBTO2? So this was a, a study made by uh, Marodo when he was in postdoc in uh, Philadelphia. You can see that brain hypoxia is an independent factor of poor outcome, independently of high ICP. And most importantly, it is dose dependent. The more uh, the duration, the longer the duration of uh, low ox uh, brain, uh, brain, the longer the duration of brain hypoxia, the um, better the outcome. This is the same thing from SAH patients. This is uh, unpublished data. We pull data from Innsbruck and Grenoble, and we look at the relationship uh, of PBTO2 values and uh, the outcome and the duration of the insult. In blue, you have uh, the good outcome, and in red, you have the bad outcome, and you, we were able to delineate a line. And for instance, if you have a, a PBTO2 of uh, 17 for five minutes, you have a poorer outcome. If you also have a higher duration uh, with a threshold of 20, and so on. So you can see that we were able to uh, kind of calculate the PPO2 burden or to estimate the PPO2 burden. And what is really interesting is even if patients with normal ICP, you can have brain hypoxia. And probably these events also uh, may influence uh, the outcome of the patient. This was uh, also shown by the study made by Marrow. And you can see that even in patients with silent hypoxia, this was an association with a, a poor outcome. So the, the one, win million question is, one billion question is, what is the impact of PPO2-guided strategies? Can we change the outcome of the patient using this device? So this was a boost to trial. So they entered uh, ICP and PBTO2 in one group. They hide the results of the PBTO2. And so with an algorithm, algorithm to treat uh, brain hypoxia, they showed that when you use PBTO2 probes, the, uh, you decrease the PBO2 burden. So you decrease the number of, of hypoxic episodes. That's quite expecting, but they, they have shown this. But what is, was really interesting, they also have a signal uh, towards an improvement of neurological outcome um, in the boost to trial when you use uh, ICP combined with BPO2. But if you look into details, you can see that the 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 CD scan of the population was a bit different between the ICP only group and the ICP plus PBTO2 group. You can see that there was more basal system compressed in uh, the ICP only group that may explain completely the results in some of uh, um, outcome. So we have, we've published uh, in November 2023 the uh, OxyTC trial, so, so we published uh, the, the, the protocol of the study uh, before the end of the study. Jean-François Payen, uh, I should admit that Jean-François Payen is the coordinator of the study. Uh, so we published a study in Lancet Neurology. You can see that we randomized 318 uh, patients. 160 were assigned to intracranial pressure only group. 100 58 were assigned to intracranial pressure plus PBTO2. Obviously, we have a uh, withdrawal of consult. We have also protocol violations with patients with non-inclusion criteria that have been included in the study. So we only have 144 patients in a modified intention to treat analysis versus 145 patients in a modified intention to treat analysis in the ICP plus PBTO2 group. The inclusion criteria were adult patients between uh, 18 and 76 years old. They should suffer from uh, severe TBI with GCS between 3 and 8 and a motor score between 1 and 5. Uh, the monitoring should be inserted within the first uh, 16 hours after admission and uh, for at least uh, 5 days. And obviously the patient should not have hemodynamic or respiratory distress. What is really important is the algorithm we put with uh, uh, the PBO2 uh, and the ICP uh, devices. So in the ICP group, if the ICP is low, okay, you make no specific intervention. Is the ICP higher than 20, so you go through tier two and tier three uh, therapies. And what is more interesting, if you have uh, ICP plus PBTO2, if the ICP high and the PBO2 is high, so you 
treat patient according to the ICP. And if the PBTO2 is low, if the ICP is low as well, then you apply specific intervention from one to seven in this order. And if the ICP obviously is high, but you first treat ICP and then correct hypoxia. And the, the, the doctors does a study quite well because if you look at the correction of brain hypoxia, you can see here in the ICP plus PB22 um, group, you can see the uh, improvement in PB202 in this group. So the, authors, uh, the, the doctors did uh, well. And if you look at the primary outcome, it was a uh, um, neurologic outcome at six months. You can see there was no difference. This is a non-significant study. And all the secondary outcomes was also uh, negative. There was no uh, significant difference between the two groups, which is, I think, disappointing. But uh, if you look at safety as well, you can see that you have more catheter dysfunction in the PBTO2 group. There was more intracerebral hematoma as well in the intracranial pressure plus PBTO2 group, which is a concern. And doing a post-hoc analysis, we found some interesting results. Um, in patients with high ICP on admission, you can see that in patients treated with ICP plus PBTO2, there was an improvement in neurological outcomes. So this is post-hoc analysis. This is only a subsample of the, of the study. Very few patients, so we have to be very cautious, but it seemed to have a signal in patients with high ICP on admission. So the RCTC trial is a negative trial. Signal in patients with high ICP on admission should be confirmed. There was more complication in the PBO2 group. So to answer the first question, I think the answer is no. There is no systematic indication of, insert, of inserting a PBO2 probe. And ancillary studies are ongoing. And we are waiting uh, right now for the MRI study, which uh, I think will be very interesting. And we're also waiting from over our city. We have the Bonanza trial ongoing, and we have also the Booth Street trial ongoing, and we are waiting for the result. I thank you for the attention. Okay, questions from the audience. We have one there. Yeah, first, we have one there, yeah. No, first one down there. Can, can you, yeah, raise your hand, please. Mark from Australia, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, my question is the high resolution data from the Canadian uh, study that you, you put up um, uh, in that paper, it suggested that the, um, if you get the CPP close to CPP opt, mm. that you're probably taking care of brain tissue oxygen because on the plateau of that curve, it looks like it's around 25 and then the Cambridge group re replicated that. Do you think that the answer could be in CPP opt or getting the, the pressure right rather than I don't know. We should prove it. Uh, maybe a CPP opt is an option that should be assessed in this patient. Maybe it, it could work, but right now nobody knows exactly. So we should have good randomized control trial to answer all this question. We have many observational data showing good association between one parameter and good outcome or bad outcome. But when you take the method and you go to an RCT, you often are disappointing. Because maybe we are too um, optimistic because thinking that just measuring PBT2 to change six month long term outcome, maybe you are, we are too optimistic. But I think what is the point of doing something if it doesn't change the outcome of the patient? This is a really hard question. And maybe with Mauro we have discussion uh, regarding this. Thank you. Please. Hello, uh, thanks Pierre for your great talk. So I would like to just to a comment. Uh, should we move to a uh, evaluation of the PTU2 not alone, like linked to the PAO2 similar mm -hmm. to the lung function? Because my, my concern is if you need to achieve, for example, a 300 millimeters of mercury of PAO2 to achieve a normal value of 25 millimeters of mercury of PTU2, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the approach should be more like lung function like related to PAO2, FIO2, exactly. are related to the PTO2 mm -hmm. like to PAO2. So not alone, that's the reason because sometimes of the, of the trials could be negative. That's just a suggestion or just to a, a comment or thought. 
Yes, you're absolutely right. That's why many ICU we use the PPO2, PAO2 ratio to interpret the PPO2. This is what I show with the study looking at the oxygen reactivity. It's not about the relationship between PAO2 and PPO2. And I think you're right. Probably it's the more smart way to, to interpret uh, PPO2. But to use a such tool, you have to be very practical and most of the patients, most of the clinicians use uh, triggers, use uh, numbers to trigger therapy, and you have to be very pragmatic when you design the study. Most of the criticism of PB2.2 relies on the first line also of the algorithm. It say, okay, just check PIO2, but if you look, it's not hyperoxia, it's just normoxia. Just check that you are normoxic. But at the end, I agree with you, if you press the button, Increase the FIO2, you will correct the, PA2, the PB2 or 2 but we won't change anything for the patient. Questions? I have one qu quick question. It doesn't look log logical for me to like randomize patients without intracranial hypertension for trials that we aim to treat mm. ICP, and then you showed in your sub-analysis that maybe there's some benefit mm. in patients like with intracranial hypertension at randomization. Do you think that the way to go is to monitor and just randomize when you have like intracranial hypertension? It's the same with ventilation, like do driving pressure trials in patients with driving yeah. pressure of 10. There's nothing we can do. We don't have to treat. Yeah. So, yeah. I think the point is the selection of patient for randomized control trial. It's beyond the fact of being, uh, having right now an intracranial hypertension because you can maybe develop an intracranial hypertension two days later. So yeah. I think the design of the RCT would be very crazy. I think the main, the main point is to have to, to be able to select patients that may benefit from the technique. And you agree, I agree. If you only use the GCS, we use the GCS to include patients. The, the heterogeneity of the population is very huge. You have patients who would never wake up because they have only one lesion <laughs> inside the brainstem. So, and you randomize with patient with patient with contusion. So it makes no sense. So maybe using Radiomix, we have a presentation about artificial intelligence. If you look at the, maybe the combination of the clinical state and the CT scan, and then you randomize to a strategy versus another is smarter than randomizing uh, on GCS. You, I think you're, you're, you're right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, our next speak speaker is Professor Mauro Odo to talk about uh, multimodal monitoring. Good afternoon. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah. These are my conflicts of interest. One is uh, related to industry, and the second one is related to my interest for quite a long time on this subject. And when I was assigned this topic, I, I asked the organizers, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, but also how can you cover multimodal monitoring in uh, 15 minutes? So, well, First of all, I want to give you the tools that are available for multimodal monitoring. And uh, as I come after distinguished uh, speakers and friends, I will not cover uh, every tool because uh, we have already uh, listened to, to some of them. But basically, this is what uh, is uh, currently available, uh, mostly uh, uh, based on invasive uh, neuromonitoring and we have heard already about intracranial pressure and brain tissue oxygen and uh, non-invasive uh, neuromonitoring and we have heard about uh, Doppler, pupillometry and, and EEG. So this is what is uh, available if we discussed about the tools. Now the question is why do we use multimodal monitoring? So why could we use several modalities to monitor in the brain? Uh, the basics is that we want to detect secondary brain insults. And for these, we have this tool focusing on intracerebral insults. But we have to consider that one, what we want to do is apply timely intervention or interventions and when we discuss about monitoring, we actually talk about treatments and multi-modality treatments. So we use several modalities. Some are uh, pharmacological, others are uh, surgical. 
and uh, uh, we intervene based on what we monitor. So it's not that the monitor by itself will change the outcome of the patients, but is what you do with the data that you collect, how you integrate uh, these data and how you adapt your treatment based on these data. And so what you see is that uh, the, the, the pattern is uh, quite complex and obviously what you want to uh, do is reduce the secondary complications based uh, on uh, edema, for example, or contusion that is going to expand. You want to prevent brain tissue loss and hopefully you want to do something in terms of uh, uh, outcome. And I will briefly also cover uh, how uh, uh, monitoring tools may give you information about uh, uh, outcome, uh, uh, neurological outcome. So this is the, these are the principles. Uh, ten years ago, uh, we conveyed uh, quite a lot of speakers, more speakers than actually monitors, uh, but we covered quite a lot of, of, of uh, monitoring modalities. So this was ten years ago. And uh, a consensus summary statement came out uh, on multi-modality monitoring neurocritical care. And what was uh, concluded is to give strong consideration uh, to provide pragmatic guidance, even in the absence of high quality data. So what I'm going to, to cover with you in the next slides uh, are only uh, uh, trials, multi-center trials, including at least 100 patients. And let's see, uh, uh, sticking on uh, neuromonitoring, what, what comes out. So what comes out first? If you look at ICP, intracranial pressure monitoring, these two trials are separated also about 10 years. So end of 2012, uh, the uh, best TRIP trial comparing intracranial pressure monitoring patients with intracranial pressure monitoring versus those without intracranial intra -cranial pressure monitoring who were treated based on repeated imaging, clinical examination, and all these patients were treated with quite a lot of uh, osmotherapy. And uh, 324 patients. You have just seen the OxyTC trial which is actually pretty similar in terms of numbers. And here, there was one group with ICP monitoring alone versus a combined usage of ICP and brain tissue oxygen monitoring. You have seen that the, uh, the management of these patients was based on an algorithm which is quite uh, uh, complex. Now, what is the information that comes out of these trials? Well, on your left hand side, you have a trial that was conducted in South America, mortality was 43%. On the right side of the panel, you have a trial conducted in France, and the mortality was 17%. So these are two different situations, and then randomized control trials here uh, are very good in terms of uh, efficiency and unbiased and high internal validity, but the problem is that they are not generalizable in a different or real-world population. So the information that you can gather is that at least uh, in France and in the real world that, that was in this study, uh, the addition of brain tissue oxygen was not superior to just having ICP monitor alone. If you go into more details in the real world, uh, this is a, a Dutch uh, trial where they actually uh, compared not only the ICP monitoring, but the treatment intensity based on the ICP monitoring. And they included uh, 266 patients, uh, multi-center study. And so you see that the, they were then analyzing uh, in these cohorts whether the outcome was influenced by the fact that there were aggressive centers treating aggressively ICP based on the ICP monitor invasively versus the non-aggressive centers in which uh, there was not uh, uh, frequently uh, ICP monitored. And what you see is that when ICP monitor was 
frequently uh, used, uh, adjusted for uh, the probability of favorable outcome, then the uh, ICP monitor group or center using uh, ICP monitor was better, doing better, and you see that uh, these uh, uh, um, treatment based on the ICP monitoring uh, treatment combined with uh, medical and surgical intervention uh, uh, again uh, provided a, a better outcome. So the information that you have with the ICP monitor integrated into a treatment can uh, make a difference. Uh, is, sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, even larger cohort study, the Synapse ICU uh, study that was conducted by uh, uh, Giuseppe Citerio in Monza and, uh, and, and other uh, collaborators. And again, ICP monitoring based treatment intensity. So this is more than 2,000 patients. And uh, um, an important information that came out uh, from uh, this cohort study, again, observational but real world information is that the use of ICP monitoring was actually associated with a more aggressive therapeutic approach and improved outcomes and especially in the most severe patient population. So it, there is a parallel uh, with what uh, we have heard about the brain tissue oxygen even if it was a postdoc analysis, small number of patients, is maybe that there is a room for monitoring these specific cases here where actually there was already at least one unreactive pupil. So the lesion was severe enough to cause brain tissue injury and, and tissue loss. So again, if you are uh, treating timely and aggressively uh, based on an invasive ICP monitor, you may uh, make a difference. Now, there has been discussion about non-invasive monitoring, compliance and TCD. Now, I must admit, uh, this to me is uh, a message that I would like to convey. It may be useful as a diagnostic test, and this has been uh, uh, shown in this multi-center study. It has also been shown by uh, a French study led by Pierre Bouzard that it may be useful as diagnostic test to rule out uh, patients with elevated ICP, especially if the elevation of ICP is above 25. But it's not reliable to measure and to monitor ICP. So you cannot replace invasive ICP monitoring with transcranial Doppler. This is not going to, uh, uh, to, to work. So if you want to measure ICP and to monitor and treat, you need to put an invasive probe. Uh, EEG. There has been a lot of debate as to whether every patient should undergo uh, continuous EEG monitoring. Now, the question is no. Uh, because if you, if you see this study that, uh, that was uh, uh, conducted in Switzerland, uh, again, this is related to, to a Swiss study, but still, if you take a, a, a number of uh, acute brain injured patients and uh, you uh, run a continuous versus intermittent routine EEG, you are able to detect a, a higher number of seizures, so that that is what was uh, demonstrated by the study, but actually the, the outcome of the patients is not influenced by the fact that you monitor continuously versus uh, 60 minutes a day. So the information that you can have with an EEG monitoring uh, short, uh, maximum one hour versus uh, 24 hours is not actually uh, going to change the outcome of the patients. What the EEG, uh, uh, routine EEG, uh, a 30 to 60 minutes uh, EEG can give you as information in terms of outcome. And these are data which uh, come uh, predominantly from uh, hypoxic brain injury patients after cardiac arrest. This was a multi-center uh, cohort study. So information gathered from the TTM1 study and the standardized EEG interpretation where, where you have the interpretation of the EEG pattern 
which you have here, continuous background versus altered background, either by suppression, birth suppression, or discontinuous background. So this is the pattern that you see. Or the, the, the change in terms of uh, reactivity of this background upon uh, a, a painful stimulation gives uh, uh, really an important information. So this data has been confirmed in a multi-center setting and uh, again the information that you can have early on uh, during the first three days applying the EEG uh, for a short time are very informative in terms of a neurological prognostication. And coupled with that this is a study that uh, Giuseppe Citerio showed uh, uh, earlier on uh, on uh, the uh, value of automated infrared pupillometry. Again, a, a subset of pa a number of patients relatively high, more than 500, of which 320 were monitored with uh, ICP. And what uh, these uh, studies showed quite convincingly, confirming also previous studies in cardiac arrest, that when the uh, uh, pupillometry gives information about abnormalities, here is an index, the neurological pupil index. When the neurological pupil index is abnormal, below three, this information is very important for you and for your patient. It means that there is something going wrong. It does not mean that if the NPI or the pupillometry is normal, the patient is doing fine. The information is that when he is abnormal, uh, there is a strong correlation with uh, a, a, a poor outcome. So the information that you gather uh, uh, with the NPI below three is very important in terms of outcomes at six months. Both, you see that the cumulative abnormalities are altering the, the neurological outcome and are uh, strongly associated with mortality. So to conclude, you use multimodal monitoring to monitor disease progression and outcome prediction. And so you want to avoid to come to the state. And this is the, the, the article uh, that is coming out from the CIBIC consensus, which was published in Intensive Care Medicine in 2019, where uh, there was uh, uh, information about management algorithm of uh, intracranial pressure elevation. And what you see here is this critical neuroworsening. So this deterioration in the neurological status that you want to prevent. And that's what the monitoring can give you as information to do timely information. So this is uh, the, the last slide. And I would conclude by saying, giving you an, a pragmatic approach. Obviously, if you are in, in large setting of uh, university centers, or if you go to certain centers like uh, in Grenoble or in Bruxelles, you may have additional information like brain tissue oxygen. But I strongly think that if you want to detect and treat secondary brain insults at the bedside to prevent uh, a neurological complication, you need to have clinical examination and neuroimaging, CT early on, MRI for outcome prediction. You need to have invasive ICP monitoring. You need to have intermittent EEG, which is also useful in terms of outcome prediction. And infrared pupillometry, as we have seen, important information in, in terms of outcome predictions and also potentially in terms of coupling with uh, invasive ICP, again, to monitor disease progression. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mauro. We've got time for questions. Maybe I'll just start. See, you're in a center and you want to put and start to invest more heavily in trying to think about neuromonitoring, but maybe you're not at the stage to get a full multimodal monitoring platform and you had to put all your eggs in one basket. What might you say, thinking about those two paradigms of prediction versus treatment, what would be the the low-cost, high-yield monitor that I might want to start introducing first? Uh, I would uh, refer to the pragmatic approach. So I would, I, I, I think we, you know, if we speak about monitoring a patient, first of all, never forget clinical examination, neuroimaging. That's one and two. And then the three is the monitoring. 
And with the data available, uh, especially, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, center TBI, synapse ICU, the invasive ICP is something that is necessary in patients with an abnormal uh, CT scan. And the invasive ICP provides you information, as uh, Gert Freud showed very nicely, uh, the ICP curve, and these informations are, are very important. Now, based on this, you can add additional uh, options. And brain tissue oxygen may be an option, but I, I think that is still not out in terms of the numbers, and uh, so maybe in these individual patients it, it may work. And then uh, I, I really think that EEG is important, and you don't need to have a continuous EEG uh, necessarily. And I think in terms of the value of the tool, in terms of the uh, practicality, uh, uh, the, the pupillometry is also helpful because it gives you, when it's abnormal, really information that there is something going wrong. And if you stick to that, then you can uh, add additional info, but uh, stick to the basic, and with these basics, then you can add additional pieces on, on top. Great. So, starting at least with the basic, like you said, ICP, hopefully people have access to it, but then really building on top of that platform with non-invasive minimal risk. Okay. Yes. Anyone, any other questions? Okay. Thank, well, thank you. you so much. Okay, we're gonna invite back up to the podium, Professor Shanique Williams-Robertson, and her second talk is going to look at the role of biomarkers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, okay, yes, the role of uh, biomarkers in uh, neuromonitoring. So again, I have no, more, no disclosures. I'm primarily going to focus on blood biomarkers since we've uh, talked um, a lot about physiologic biomarkers thus far. Um, and I will start with just thinking about the, the different um, sort of co context in which you would uh, use blood biomarkers for neuromonitoring in, in the ICU. Oops, let me go back there. Yikes, go back. So uh, we could be looking at what happened before the patient arrived, so diagnosing existing symptoms. Uh, we could lo be looking at uh, assessing the, the integrity of brain function at present, so what's happening now. We could be looking at trying to forecast neurologic deterioration sometime during the ICU stay. And then there's predicting long-term outcomes um, after the ICU. Um, and I just want to give a spoiler alert. <laughs> Um, there is actually not a lot out there. There, uh, there are only uh, very, very few uh, blood biomarkers that could be that are accepted for clinical use at this point. What I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about those, and as well as tell you a little bit about what could potentially be on on the horizon in terms of uh, things that have been identified to be associated with neurologic disease and in critical illness. So diagnosing existing symptoms, specifically, you, this can be uh, a thing that we are examining in the context of seizures. Uh, and, and specifically, the idea is that someone comes to your ICU or is in your ICU or uh, comes to your ER with something that shakes that's a spell, um, either shaking or a, a spell of altered mental status just transiently. And um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, it was known 40 years ago that uh, the prolactin actually elevates in these, con in these contexts. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is not just uh, in the context of acute uh, convulsive seizure, but also in terms of in the context of uh, focal impaired awareness seizures, which back at uh, that time was were called complex partial seizures or even simple partial seizures. But basically, uh, there have been studies uh, since a long time and also uh, repeated more recently where uh, the prolactin was measured shortly after the event of interest and uh, was noted to be elevated by comparison to the prolactin levels that were considered at baseline, which could be, say, six hours later or 24 hours later. Um, it's believed to be, so prolactin is, is uh, uh, secreted from the, uh, from the um, 
<laughs> pituitary, uh, stimulated by uh, dopaminergic, or sorry, excuse me, modulated by dop dopaminergic cells in the hypothalamus, and, and so it's thought that the seizures may affect these, uh, these modulating cells and, and thus uh, uh, allow for removal of the breaks, so to speak, um, and allowing for um, release of prolactin. <clears throat> it's not something that I use very often in clinical care, but it's certainly something that is approved, or I will say is still part of the uh, guidelines uh, for, for use and would technically be a, a neuromonitoring uh, biomarker uh, in the ICU. This is yet another example of a, a more recent uh, couple of studies that sort of were able to distinguish between epileptic seizures and non-epileptic events. Uh, interestingly, the study uh, could not really distinguish between non-epileptic events uh, and syncopal spells as, as well. Next step, assessing neurologic integrity. Um, so I'm focusing mostly here on traumatic brain injury. And uh, what uh, we'll start with is just this quick diagram of a neuron cell body. I don't know if you remember from your, uh, your, your basic neuroanatomy in medical school, the, the myelin sheaths, the uh, axons, and the, the axon terminals at the end uh, with the, uh, uh, what we see right here is a, a glial cell, an astrocyte. Uh, and there are several potential biomarkers or, or several potential uh, proteins that could be, could be studied, that could be useful in the context of, of neurovascular injury and TBI. Um, I'm going to focus uh, specifically on the most promising ones that have been um, identified, although several of these have been, uh, have been tested and, and shown potential uh, for, um, for elevation in the context of traumatic brain injury. And specifically where it can be useful um, is especially is, is in two ways. One is distinguishing mild TBI from, uh, from no TBI or, 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 or essentially prognosticating in terms of how severe a mild TBI could be. And then there's also uh, uh, prognosticating in the long term in terms of a moderate to severe TBI. So the one biomarker that is, uh, that's actually been um, accepted for uh, in recommended guidelines um, in uh, the, in Sweden, did I get this right? Uh, excuse me, is, is S100B. And basically the thought is that uh, it could potentially be useful in the very mild cases to distinguish between folks who need a CT uh, and, and follow-up imaging versus those who could just be discharged with uh, instructions to monitor for um, that have very, very low chance of, of having some significant uh, compromise. <clears throat> excuse me. S100B is also been um, replicated as, as a uh, potential biomarker in a larger study um, more recently of uh, uh, patients uh, in the U.S. where if you just, I know this is kind of a crazy slide, but if you focus on the, 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 two, uh, the, the two groups on the, on the far right, uh, the S100B, sorry, sorry, I switched over, not S100B, uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein and the uh, UCHL1, these proteins are both elevated in, uh, in the context of folks who have uh, CT, image, CT imaging evidence of traumatic brain injury uh, by comparison to groups who do not have such, such imaging evidence. I uh, know. There you go. So you, you can see that. Now I know how to use the laser. Um, I wanted to... So... GFAP and UCHL1 have not actually been um, recommended, as have not actually made the guidelines yet. I think that they are coming. Um, but one thing to, uh, to keep in mind is that they, uh, the, the timing with which you draw these biomarkers has a significant impact on what you are likely to see uh, if you are, uh, if you are uh, looking to, to sort of distinguish between mild and moderate or moderate to severe TBI. So this is a group that, uh, that distinguished between uh, no mild or moderate TBI and then mild or moderate TBI. Um, and as you can see, the uh, glial fibrillary acidic protein levels uh, raised significantly, and the UCHL1 levels in, here in yellow were also quite high uh, right after the TBI, but they certainly uh, varied over the course of several hours <clears throat> after the injury, where the GFAP uh, elevated um, quite uh, within, after, within 24 hours and kind of peaked at about 24 hours and then went away after about, by about 72 hours. And the UCHL1 was peaked right 
uh, at presentation, but then dropped off relatively uh, quickly. So if you're, you know, seeing this, these patients at, in a delayed, at a delayed time point, then these biomarkers are going to be a little bit less useful for you, but uh, they could still be quite useful. Um, and I, I suspect that they will make their way into prime time. Er, what did I want to show you here? Oh, here's just a, um, a, I'm trying to go fast, and so I'm, I'm flustering myself, excuse me. But there's a, uh, a, a, a sort of a meta-analysis that kind of looked at these biomarkers across the board. And again, um, GFAP and uh, neuro, neuron-specific enolase seem to be of interest as well. Um, but UCHL1 and S100B also popped out, uh, sorry, uh, also got, got approached statistical significance in terms of the uh, dif uh, in terms of its uh, differentiating ability between uh, severe and um, non-severe, in this case measured by whether or not there was brainstem injury present. So moving on to forecasting neurologic deterioration. Um, so what's gonna happen tomorrow to your patient? So your patient is, um, is fine in the ICU, but are they um, at risk for delirium, for example, a common, as I mentioned before, common complication of their, um, of their ICU stay. Here, I'm looking again at the, uh, at the sort of uh, basic neuroanatomy, the, the neuron. Here, I've added a few additional biomarkers that have been studied in this, in this context, mostly related to the blood-brain barrier and uh, endothelial um, presence of uh, evidence of endothelial in injury. Um, and <clears throat> of these biomarkers, <clears throat> excuse me, the S100B also has been uh, noted to be of interest as well as the uh, plasma, ac plasma activator inhibitor one and the E-selectin. Um, and so uh, as we can see, this was uh, work done actually in the uh, brain ICU cohort uh, at the SIP Center at Vanderbilt uh, comparing the, uh, these biomarkers among folks with versus without ICU delirium and then, um, and then specifically uh, the duration of their delirium or specifically their delirium and coma free days, uh, one could see that uh, PAI1 uh, and uh, E-selectin and also S100B again, sorry, um, uh, had uh, seemed to to have some predictive, uh, predictive power there. Um, however, as these have been attempted across multiple cohorts, and there are a few biomarkers that have actually replicated across those cohorts, probably uh, this was a sort of a meta-analysis across, across several cohorts comparing delirium coma-free days and, uh, uh, and some of the biomarker levels as well as uh, the severity of delirium in the biomarker levels. S100B again seemed to be promising, um, as well as IL-8, which is a marker of inflammatory or of inflammatory state. Uh, a, another meta-analysis looked at uh, some of the biomarkers of inflammatory state as well as uh, biomarkers associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and related dementias, and again, picked out a few different uh, biomarkers. So this is evidence that these things are very sort of nonspecific. They may point to an underlying mechanism or at least predisposition, but not really be uh, focused biomarkers of delirium. Um, some of the inflammatory biomarkers are also implicated. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I've been talking away from the microphone all this time. <laughs> I apologize. It's good. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the biomarkers uh, have also been, been implicated in uh, as we're thinking forward to what happens after the ICU and uh, cognitive, long-term cognitive and uh, psychological cognitive impairment and functional impairment. Um, again, uh, of a of several biomarkers that have been looked at, uh, both uh, S100B and E-selectin, again, a, a measure of, of uh, endothelial injury and, and blood-brain barrier dysfunction, seem to have been uh, identified as, as independent predictors of worse cognitive function at three and 12 months. And of uh, note, this, uh, this relationship was modified by uh, the presence of neuroinflammation sorry, the presence of inflammation, which was uh, modeled as the levels of, of IL-6 in the blood there. So um, you can see at the high, higher levels of IL-6, S100B was 
um, was clearly a uh, independently associated with um, with the uh, uh, cognitive levels of cognitive function. This measured in in uh, our band's global scores, whereas uh, at the lower levels of IL six, there was uh, there was not a clear relationship. Um, this is also shown, kind of repeated at this graph, uh, specifically with regards to S100B, where the relationship between, uh, between the, again, on the now y-axis, the R-band's global score, so a cognitive score, a score of cognitive function, was, um, was slightly different at the, at the lower levels of IL-6 by comparison to the higher levels of IL-6, but there was, there was a clear and, and consistent relationship. Uh, and now this is an extraordinarily busy slide, which was looking at uh, predicting fun uh, fu cognitive function and functional d disability using uh, a host of inflammatory biomarkers. Of the number of inflammatory biomarkers that came out, only CRP, C-reactive protein, and uh, MMP9 were identified as, um, as independent predictors, and specifically, uh, they were uh, independent predictors of functional outcomes uh, at the both three-month uh, time point, which is shown in blue, and the 12-month time point, which is shown in red. So key takeaways, and I've left us a couple of minutes. Uh, key takeaways. So looking at what uh, we can, how we can use blood biomarkers for neuromonitoring. Again, very few biomarkers that are actually have actually been. Um, accepted for clinical use. I think that there's a lot that needs to be done in order to um, to provide some utility for these. Um, but prolactin is certainly something that could help with uh, epileptic seizure diagnosis, if that's something that you need. Uh, uh, S100B, uh, GFAP, and, uh, and UCHL1 seem to show some promise in assessing TBI severity and also identify potentially the need for neuroimaging. And then, uh, again, S100B may I don't know, may turn out to be the creatinine of the brain, um, but certainly a number of, of studies, a, no, a number of more uh, larger sample controlled studies need to be performed in order to, uh, to validate that. This is just a summary in that, uh, in sort of a more summarized form. I will leave that alone. And then um, I think some of the future research needs, uh, if it were me designing these studies, I would, uh, uh, I would uh, pursue some more mechanistic investigations, perhaps in preclinical models to examine disease subtypes in particular, uh, determine the role of these biomarkers in, in disease pathogenesis, and then uh, evaluate what the response to interventional studies could be in some of these uh, biomarkers. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We are running late, so we should just move to the next presentation. I would like to invite Sujin Park to talk about data science to integrate all this. Thank you. So for those who have stayed this whole time, I applaud your endurance. And um, I've been assigned the task of talking about data science to integrate this all. Um, oh, can't go back. Yeah, data science to integrate all of this. And so it necessarily is both a practical as well as a potential or aspirational talk. So I think you'll be able to identify which is which. So I don't have to repeat this at all. We're talking about multimodality monitoring, some of it being invasive, some of it being non-invasive. And this is, as Giuseppe pointed out earlier, this is a very old paper that he wrote that focused on the fact that there is a bottleneck of all of these single stream modalities of monitoring if you wanted to get any good information beyond just threshold based alarms from your singular monitors you really need to time sync this data with each other and also possibly the systemic physiology to, and the neurological exam to understand what is happening in real time that is the benefit of these monitors after all and this is a bottleneck because some data science some technology is required for this to be um, come to fruition and amazingly it has been quite hard. I will say, though, uh, counter to what was present 10 years ago, whenever this, this article was written, my eyesight is gone now, is that we do have some solutions that are commercially available, either primarily for this function or as a side effect or an additional benefit that allows us to do this now. Um, so I want to focus on this blue box, which is the ultimate, right? What are our tasks with multimodality monitoring and how can maybe data science, both visualization and analysis, help us? And these are in two categories. One is in detection of certain events 
in a time varying way, and the other one is more in goal setting. So more in detection. This is going to kind of hop around. This is just a case trying to make it uh, so relevant to your practice. So this is a 73-year-old woman with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, she she gets comes to the hospital. She gets her aneurysm clipped, clot evacuated, a bundle is placed, and then she is monitored. Then what? So then over her stay, um, we can look at the multiple streams of data very simply by just visualizing along with EEG, understanding her sequential CT scans, and can look at things like brain tissue oxygen, EEG, surface EEG, microdialysis, and see a pattern that emerges in each of these single modalities that alone might be suggestive and together are very highly directive in terms of looking for and finding and intervening on impending or occurring ischemia. So in this case, this patient was detected early, it was treated, and she was able to be discharged conscious and following commands after having come in with a GCS, I think was eight. So sort of shifting sets now to more seizures, non-convulsive seizures. Thinking about a threshold-based use of an alarm, if on the left you see a brain tissue oxygen on a patient with sequential um, seizures that were not identified in real time, so that's unfortunate for this patient. Look at the, each vertical line represents a single seizure over multiple days. And in this kind of a patient, what you would expect, and in fact what our guidelines say, is to look for your brain tissue oxygen to dip below 20, if you look into that guideline, it comes from nowhere. There are no studies that actually show that your brain tissue oxygen ought to decline. And in fact, if you look at MRI bold studies, both in animal and humans, of real-time seizure, you actually see what you, you ought to. You've increased your met metabolic demand. You have an increase of blood flow to that area. And perhaps after some time, you have a burnout, and you might see a reduction of oxygen. And in fact, that's what was seen in this particular group of patients. Um, in addition, on the right side is another example. On the bottom line is cerebral blood flow. And you see that rise in cerebral, oh, second to bottom is cerebral blood flow. Well, anyway, you see this sort of subtle rise in cerebral blood flow. And in and of itself, it may not be indicative of seizure. But along with the other things, the rising heart rate, the rising blood pressure, these are subtle signs. If together, if a human with expert uh, ability may or may not suspect it, certainly we could build a machine that could try to classify this as what's the differential diagnosis for this abrupt, clear change in all of the physiology, and seizure would be high on the list. Another example of using data integration and visualization to look for real-time evidence of syndromes that we can intervene on. So we're familiar potentially with paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity or storming that we see often in all kinds of secondary brain injury, thought to be a result of a disconnection syndrome where you have the afferent and the efferent and you can have either um, side being stimulated. And you see, if you, you know, the blood pressure rises, the heart rate rises, the respiratory rate often rises. In this case, it did not. And it was stimulated by a non-nociceptive stimulus of chest physical therapy. And what's not seen is, uh, oftentimes, as we don't have a monitor, is an increase in ICP and potentially a drop in brain tissue hy hypoxia. And I think with the earlier diagnosis of something like storming, you're going to be able to see this. Oftentimes, these patients are found in when they're um, convalescing and they miss these events. So this is a challenging thing. There are many mimics. You know, you might have one episode in a shift, and then the next shift you might have another. And because it looks like so many different things, you will have a singular team dealing with it with a variety of uh, generic or nonspecific tools, and then the next shift is forgotten, and it's sort of starting the whole thing like a groundhog day. Oh, that's a US term. I'm so sorry. But it's sort of a repetitive experience that has no learning associated with it. So. You would think, well, this is obvious. I would definitely see this. Well, if you were to walk by, you have 18 to 60 patients you're taking care of, and you are walking by the room or even next to the patient, and you look at the top screen and you look at the bottom screen, not at the same time, but as a moment in time, as one of the, I think somebody mentioned earlier, 200 decisions uh, that you have to make in the day. And probably thousands of data points you're ingesting in that day. There's nothing inherent in that difference that's going to say, ah, this patient is definitely storming. But if you were to look at the inverse of this interval and visualize in just a simple, different way, so now as a line graph, you can see and zooming out, this is a big change in a patient and what's going on. So it turns out this is diaphoresis, sweating, agitation is noted at the same time with no trigger that was noted. You see the resolution. Ativan is given, not quite, another dose of Ativan is given, and then you see the resolution. And now you zoom out to a whole shift, or maybe two shift, and you see this is a pattern. This is a recognition of an event 
because you're able to see and zoom out. And so this is the advantage of using really simple tools. You're not even doing analysis. You're just visualizing the data to be able to see patterns. That's a single stream. Now imagine if you were to put multiple streams together because the consensus definition of diagnosing storming is to look at all of these um, quantitative increases in intervals of blood pressure, the systemic variables, as well as some of the qualitative, which you can actually score. Even if you're sweating or glistening, you have droplets of beads, right? Or you're very damp. So these are like qualitative ways of even looking at this and you can actually chart this and be able to, to build um, basically a detection tool for something as common as storming. If you want to get even more aspirational and complicated, maybe you have your multimodality monitoring data, you have your systemic data, and now you want to say, okay, I have a group of patients that I know this is a pattern from time zero, from the ictus of the event till time onset of this uh, secondary injury. I have a group of patients that I know had this injury and a group of patients who didn't. But when they're happening, they're all sick, they have a monitor because they were um, having a disorder of consciousness. I cannot tell between those two patients which patient's going to have it and which patient is not. And I know for these highly monitored patients, about 45, not 30, but 45% of these patients are going to have ischemia. And so if I can put all of that data together in a multimodal fashion, in a time varying way, and build a vector, a vector is just like representing a line belt, really like a nonlinear coalition of data points. If I can represent those patients who are gonna have the disease and patients who are not, and then I take my patient that's unknown at the moment and match them up and in a time varying way, see what is the angle? What's the difference between this patient and that group of patients? You can actually figure out which group you're more closer to for that patient. So now goal setting. So I'm not going to go into sort of the background of this like I had intended to do because of the fact that I'm seeing some kidney people walking in behind us. But um, essentially, maybe many of you are aware of the sort of concept of autoregulation um, states that a patient may be in, depending upon things that we might iatrogenically be able to manipulate, like blood pressure or just the status of the disease itself. What we do know about autoregulation or dysautoregulation is that it's a time-varying event that has a quite an interesting trajectory for patients with brain injury, especially TBI or subarachnoid hemorrhage, for example. This is a nice um, natural experiment where in two very similar types of organizations, they had a very different philosophical approach to management of severe TBI. In Sweden, they had a very ICP-driven approach, and in, in, um, in, I think, Scotland, it was much more of a let's enhance your CPP, push your CPP up to enhance perfusion. When a natural history experiment, and like, let's look at the upslow box, on the X axis is sort of your slope that represents sort of your autoregulatory ability. Let's just, for, just trust me, that says on the left side, that's well autoregulating, on the right side, you're poorly autoregulating. And on the Y axis is your percentage of like likelihood of having a good outcome. So if it's high, it's good. If it's low, it's bad. And so in an upslow where it's an ICP-driven um, uh, approach, you're tending to do better when your autoregulation is poor. But if your autoregulation is, is intact, you're actually not doing enough. But in a very similar um, institution, but in Scotland, when they're pushing CPP up on all of their patients, the patients who do well are the ones who are autoregulating well and they can control for it. But the ones who are poorly autoregulating have passive perfusion and you're doing harm. So this is a wonderful natural experiment. Now, if you overlie that, is there some threshold at which you can predict or understand, I should say, your autoregulation state so that you can actually start to protocolize your treatment, not just for all patients, but for your individual groups of patients in this setting? So this flexible data visualization um, could potentially lead you to the point where you can look at this relationship between these blood pressures and ICP to understand that, that state of autoregulation your patient might be in that moment or in the prior couple of hours to maybe try to guide what your next step is going to be and then get feedback and understand was I right or was I wrong. And I say that because we're not quite where we need to be to understand because we have not done full clinical trials to prove this might be just an epiphenomenon of injury. If you're unable to autoregulate, maybe that's why you're not doing well. I would say I've continued to be hopeful because of studies like that one that I showed you, the Tim Howells one, where you have this natural experiment where really there was a, a lot of similarities and really just one primary difference. This is just a quick slide showing that you can um, computerize this and give a nice correlation value between negative one and positive one that gives you sort of that summary of autoregulation. And Marcel Aries and group, uh, who's sitting in the second row, he was able to show that you could do this in a continuous fashion, a computerized way at the bedside. 
And unlike something like CPP, which we traditionally think is really associated with outcome, it turns out that this autoregulation index, or the cerebrovascular reactivity index, I should be more precise, is actually more associated significantly with your mortality and your outcome than something that we traditionally think is more important, had been more important, like CPP. Um, you can define sort of a, a, a sort of for a patient within a certain segment of time that you can have a range of CPP values at which at the extremes it may be harmful and maybe in the middle is where you might want to try to uh, approach. And um, what has been shown is that if you can look at this nadir or sort of the, the middle part where you're on your y-axis is your PRX, your index, remember high, bad, low, good, and the x-axis is your CPP bins of that you've been experiencing over the last few hours. If you want to think about where is my PRX low, it tends to be sort of in that range of CPP, and that's sort of become known as the optimal CPP. And what's really compelling is that if you look retrospectively at cohorts and see what was their actual ICP, I mean their CPP that was experienced, and how far and in what direction was it from that optimal CPP. Well, it turns out the further you are away from that calculated optimal CPP, you did worse. If you were below, that group tended to die, and the ones who were higher tended to live, but the further you were away from your optimal calculated, it seems like those are the patients who did um, worse. And so this is also a little compelling about should we be doing a, a clinical trial? So Marcel Aries and, and his friends and three other centers really tried to do this feasibility trial, feasibility and safety trial, to look at a targeted CPP op for severe TBI patients and to see are we able to show this to people and can they achieve it? And additionally, is it safe? And it, it turns out that it is feasible and it does seem to be safe. And what we're all waiting for is Marcel to uh, organize a clinical trial to do this for effect. Of course, choosing an outcome is really the challenge in the community face to quite define this, perhaps with biomarkers. Um, given that we only have an hour, a uh, minute and a half, I'm really not going to go into this very um, deeply, but just to know that we have been looking at this in subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the same relationships seem to be true. And what's most important is that if you look at just the actual blood pressure values and ICP values and CPP values that these patients are experiencing, they're all within what you would be call, calling normal. This is what you want for the patient. And so as a brushstroke across all patients, you're doing a good job. But for individual patients, you're not doing enough to find the right goal, potentially, that could potentially avoid ischemia, infarct, and improve uh, morbidity and mortality. Some work has been done to try to associate multiple streams of data. This is looking at autoregulation and that kind of U-shaped curve, as well as the effect that the CPP has on blood on PBTO2 or brain tissue oxygen. And what's been shown over and over um, is that on the lower end, when you're sort of under perfusing, that is where your PBTO2 seems to drop. And on the upper end, when you're over perfusing, it doesn't seem to have that much of a, of a relationship. This has been shown on the left in ICH patients. So that dark line is the, the frequency of brain hypoxia um, uh, episodes. And so you see on that lower end of your under optimal CPP, your brain tissue oxygen, um, uh, your hypoxia um, episodes seem to go up. And on the right, it seems to have no relationship. And we've shown this in subarachnoid hemorrhage now as well. And interestingly, on the lower end, it really impacts your autoregulation. On the upper end, it doesn't seem to. We've looked at this with seizure, you know, with your optimal and your, and your delta. And it turns out that when you're higher, you have what's really what we would be calling press or encephalopathy syndrome from too much blood perfusion. These patients tend to have more IIC, ictal interictal continuum, and seizures. And it doesn't have to be too high, but a little bit like point plus seven millimeters of mercury above your optimal calculated. But those patients actually do better. They go home, they go to rehab, and the ones who are under who didn't have the seizure, they have a shorter length of stay, but they go to the nursing home. Interesting. So maybe we have to think about what is the optimal range. So um, this is something that a lot of people just like to take a picture of, but this is my personal approach. So I want to give you a caveat that how I might approach in a very practical way. I have these numbers, and what am I going to do with it? I do want to point out that we just completed the inaugural State of the Union in terms of what are what is everyone doing? Because I shouldn't be able to sit up here and tell you what I do, and then it's not evidence proven, and like, what are you doing? So we've, we've started to collect information while we are waiting for our clinical trials to catch up about how are we going to manage these numbers. I should stop now. Um, so I'll stop there, yeah. So thank you very much for your attention.
I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to close off there. Sorry, we couldn't have any questions. Uh, that's the end of our really great neuromonitoring session. I want to thank